This week, episode 331 of Stogie Geeks, Drew and I interview Steve Saka, founder of Dunbar and Tobacco and Trust. Steve's path towards cigar stardom did not begin over a century ago in Cuba. It began in the 80s, and he took his path and forged his own way through our premium cigar industry. It's such a great story. In the 2000s, Steve brought an ex- he, he was brought on as an exclusive consultant for JR Cigars, the world's largest cigar store. And he immediately used his internet savvy to make his wealth of cigar information accessible to everyone in online communities. He literally paved the way for um, outlets like us uh, and other podcasts uh, to exist on the internet. We're going to get a chance to stab into that. Uh, If the name rings a bell, years later, Steve was approached with a job on the manufacturing side, and he held the position of president of La Grande Fabrica de Drew Estate. That's quite impressive. Responsible for Liga Providers and T-52s and all the good stuff that we like to enjoy, for sure. And in 2015, Steve made his return to the industry to start his own company, Dunbar and Tobacco and Trusts. His initial release includes the Sobre Mesa, Mi Carita, and Umbagog. I got a lot to say about the Umbagog. Super cool stick. Stogie Geeks, Drew and I are excited. I hope you're excited too. Episode 331 starts right now. This is a Security Weekly production. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show where cigars burn slow, ashes fall fast, and cocktails flow steady. It's the Stogie Geek Show. Welcome everyone to the Stogie Geek Show. Joe and I are already silly. Oh yeah. yeah. Joe Hosempa, a.k.a. Joe Hollywood is here with me in studio. I'm fired up. Cigars, perfected for more than 150 years. Yours to enjoy now. Havana Cigar Club, located in Warwick, Rhode Island, is a great place to enjoy a drink and a cigar. Stogie Geeks listeners can find a $5 off coupon on our website by clicking the HCC logo. Stogie Geeks, episode 331 is... uh, The time has arrived. This date has been on the calendar for at least a month. Super excited to introduce our guest. But before we do that, I want to introduce my co-host, the little doc here from Texas, Mr. Drew Galvin. What's up? Hey, how's it going? Um, It's it's going great, man. (laughs) It's going great. It's hot over here in Texas, man. It's already over the century mark. Just in the last couple of days, it's been, uh, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna lose some pounds here, just walking back and forth and what have you. Uh, other than that, just trying to stay clear of any of the, uh, you know, the protests and things of that nature here in our neighborhood. I'm in I'm in Dallas, Texas, so, uh, you know, it's just uh, we've had our share of excitement in that uh, arena for sure. Mm. But uh, other than that, yes, I am very excited that Steve Saka is on. I know uh, it's been. Uh, a month, and I know we talked about it a few months ago, but uh, very excited to have him here and uh, get to talk about the cigars and his uh, his history in the cigar industry and uh, go from there. Awesome. I'm so Welcome, ex- Steve. Welcome, Steve, to the Stogie Geek Show. It is a privilege and an honor to have you here for sure. Uh, I'm sure you have tons of fascinating stories. One of the two focuses I want to focus on is if you could take us through the beginning and the internet type stuff that you did, because from from reading your bio and knowing a little bit about you, um, you are not shy at all. And I can't wait to uh, hear about uh, when that started and then talk about your initial releases from when you um, took a hiatus and went back into the industry to do your own to do your own company and produce super awesome sticks. 
Uh, mm. Like the Sobra Mesa, Mi Carita, Umbagog. I'm smoking your uh, Mustara del Saka right now. I raided from Paul's Humidor because I went next door to see what they had, Steve Saka, and because of COVID times, they blew out. And I know that they had a ton of Sobra Mesas there, and I know when the Mi Carita hit that place, it was tough for them to keep them in over at the Havana C- uh, Cigar Club right next door to us uh, here at the G-Unit Studios. But Steve, welcome to the show. How are you, sir? Good, thank you. Uh, Two quick comments. Number one, 331, that's quite an achievement. So congrats to you guys. Anyone that's dumb enough to do this 331 times in a row deserves extra (laughs) kudos. And number two, I apologize to the audience right now. I know we're nearly as impressive as they're making the sound. So set the bar a little lower, maybe it'll be okay. I, I'm not one to super stretch stuff. Like if you've watched some of my interviews uh, there in the past, I'm not one. But but you know, like I said, I've I've heard so many stories about you in and out of cigar shops from patrons. Uh, I've heard so much stories about you from in and out of cigar shops who showed up to trade shows. Um, heard about you, smoked your product when you were with Drew Estate. Um, you know. But I have not heard much of your earlier stuff. If 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 you could start there for me, I don't know why it's intriguing me. Maybe uh, I'm looking too you know why, too why deep why into it. Why it intrigues you but. is because it's what we all dream of. I mean, I was essentially just a fat white dude that really loves cigars, and uh, I was given you know I started smoking when I was enlisted in the Navy, and when I got out of the service, and I started actually making a real paycheck because I was back during the Reagan years. We got no money at all. I uh, started to have a little bit of a cigar budget and started a small engineering company. And uh, God bless me. And I was successful, which let me piss away more money on cigars and cigar related travel. And uh, at one point, uh, I was spending probably upwards of fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 a year on cigars and cigar related travel. And, um, and I was just kind of known as the local cigar guy. You know, I was the Uber cigar geek, but You know, there weren't that many of us at that point. It was rather rare. And then the advent of the Internet becoming accessible, I started communicating on AOL.com back when it was a dial-up service. Mm -hmm. Just actually connect your phone to the little coupler, and it would do that weird sound effect that I'm not even going to pretend to make. And uh, (laughs) I discovered there were like six more of us, seven more of us out there in the world. And that then led to me getting onto Usenet news groups. Um, and that was back in the day when Usenet wasn't just porn and pirated videos. It, it had a lot of little niche groups, you know, the quilters and the fly fishermen. And there turned out to be one for cigar smokers. And uh, in the beginning, there were maybe 20, 25 of us. And we used to use that to communicate. For consumers that don't know what Usenet is, it's very similar to Reddit, but without all the people. You know what I mean? Because mm-hmm. it was all just right. a really small thing. And... Uh, I started just writing a lot about cigars and my related travels with cigars and the factory owners I met and the factories I visited. And uh, it led to me doing taste tests in the group, which then led to me doing a website called Cigar Nexus with two of my friends. And uh, we had like, we probably had one of the very first uh, consumer based internet websites. It was, uh, It was, uh, you know, it was cutting edge at the time, but looking at it now, it looks like dog shit. I mean, you're looking at a web page from 1995, 96, you know, and um, and we did that for like three years and we made zero money. Um, There was never really any intent to make money. We really used it more as a way to write off our expenditures. So we were basically basically using it as a tax shelter uh, to pay for our hobby. And um that then led to me getting hired by Lou Rothman, who at the time owned JR Cigar, who was the number one retailer of cigars in the world at that point. And, um, and I ended up taking over his internet part of the business and just doing general cigar stuff. And we got bought out by Altidus, which put me into another non-compete, which then led to Jonathan Drew approaching me to, be, to go work for Drew Estate. I wasn't interested. Then he said, well, what if I make you president? I wasn't interested. And then he said, well, what if I make you a president and a vested partner with no money in? Well, I always liked that. And I thought I'm going to put up any cash. You know, what the heck? We'll take a roll of the dice. 
And so I joined Drew Estate and it's really, you know, it wasn't, the company had already been around for like seven years, but it was pretty much only a, an infused, primarily acid. They had other brands. They had natural, they had acid, they had Isla del Sol, which are all brands that are still in the marketplace, but they didn't really have anything traditional that ever really caught. And I was there at Drew until 2013. And then of my own stupid accord, I decided to leave. That had more to do with my wife because she hated Miami. I hated Miami too. Miami's not built for, you know, fat white guys. It's built for pretty people that, you know, like to be seen and hang out and socialize. And uh, it just really was never a comfortable fit for us. And uh, she eventually returned to New England. And I tried to stay with Drew for an extra year and a half, but I was in charge of the factory. I was the president of the U.S. And it just wasn't, it just wasn't physically possible. After about 18 months, I just finally went in one day and said, guys, I've tried, but, you know, it's just not working. And uh, they were a little bit mad at me in the beginning because we had a really good run from 2005 to 2013. But in the end, they understood. They were my friends. And it wasn't like I was coming and saying, okay, you got to give me more shares in the company for me to stay. You got to double my salary to stay. I wasn't saying any of those things. I was saying, hey, guys, I made an honest, good faith effort. And I just don't think I'm the guy anymore for you. And I ended up leaving another non-compete. And then I started Dunbarton Tobacco and Trust in uh, 2015, which is a small family-owned company. My wife is an equal partner in it. Uh, my son works at the company. We only have three other full-time employees. We're, we're a very, very small, lean, light company. And we pretty much now, we just make, we just make shit that I like that uh you know i tend to be towards the top end of the sphere is where i like to be it's what i currently smoke obviously wasn't that way when i was enlisting the navy couldn't afford it but i pretty much focus only on those type of products now and yeah it is what it is hmm <laughs> that's a that's a mouthful um my question uh you've seen the like drew estate we mentioned this probably at least once a month if not every other month that their story is remarkable their brand loyalty is remarkable it is remarkable they have a freaking army out there right and it's like you and 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 i can use the word army because i've i use the word army i've used i i've used i've i've owned a cigar shop here in the providence metro uh from 99 till 2003 and then okay. it um it uh, we cl closed it down and it reopened up as a cigar shop that's still in existence today. Um, we just had again differences of opinion and location and place and all that stuff and 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 that was just the way it went. And yeah. it's great to see it thrive and and to see it still existing. Um, and you know, so I remember like now Drew's up to like twenty seven different. Uh, brand label names and all of that stuff and and uh you know it's 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 and there's probably more because i'm gonna get email now so if i if it's 28 or 9 email drew at stogies.com <laughs> don't email me right yeah. just and then drew will tell me i was wrong i don't need to hear it 50 times though <laughs> but but to my knowledge it's like 27 up there and Let's some of those there's a boatload there's a there, lot it, but, but, it's but a there, big company but the reason why i use the word ami is because there's also an image with that cigar smoker right and then i'm very friendly obviously with with the local brick and mortar shops here in in definitely in the providence metro not so much new england i don't get up i don't get up north of boston as much as i should um there but you know i do go a little bit west as far as queensbury new york it's just outside of albany and you know and 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 you get the beat but 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 the drew like you've seen that company start with a fewer SKUs and like you said infuse stuff and then make a transition and it's still a transition uh, that and still products even the non-infused stuff that are sought after today like it's just that they have such brand loyalty and then all of that and then you want to start a company which I don't want to say it's the total opposite of that, but you want to, you want to make good stuff that tastes good 
and caters to whatever audience that, of you're doing with 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 your target profile. You know, I mean, part of it has to do with just me being smart about this. I mean, it, one of the benefits that I have is, you know, I was an Uber geek. I was then at JR Cigar, where I got a tremendous education, courtesy of Lou Rothman, in you know how the sales side of the business work. You know, not at the retail, you know, in the trenches store level, but more direct to the consumer. And you learn a lot about what consumers react to, positive, mm-hmm. negative. And you're in a you're in a system that you are doing, you know, 50 new things every single month. So you have an awful lot of data to work with. So that was very educational. And then I had the experience of, you know, being in charge of a company that uh, was kind of on the on the come up. But the reality was it was near bankruptcy and we were just really surviving, barely hanging on by a thread for years, even after I was there. And, you know, getting into the more manufacturing and the factory side and, you know, but to the tobaccos and whatnot. So oddly enough, I have a career path that is very unique because I've been in a lot of different segments. And typically, that's not the way that works in our business. Most people work their way from the bottom up, and normally they start as salespeople, and that's how they become, um, in the United States at least, and that they end up becoming the principals of their company. And so that education for me, which was all just learned through experience, has a tremendous value. And it's something that I was able to apply to the new company. And like I understand all the mechanics and the math and the distribution and the regulation and the legal the legal issues and that's something that most small manufacturers they really they're learning that as they go and they're probably never going to have the experience of being at a company that was doing you know you know getting approaching a hundred million dollars a year type of experience and so what ends up happening is that kind of really helps to shape where I am. And the thing that I realized from jump is I could never compete on price because if you don't actually physically own the factory yourself and not just owning the factory, but you really have to be producing somewhere in excess of about 40 to 45,000 handmade cigars a day before you hit that economic efficiency curve. Mm -hmm. So if you're doing a small boutique factory, you can't hit those numbers necessary uh, to get those efficiencies. So you can't compete on price. And I had no interest in operating a factory with, you know, that made 50,000 cigars a day in Nicaragua. It sounds good, but that comes with a lot of burdens. Yep. Uh, you know, you got to find a place to sell all those cigars all the time because every day you're making 50,000 cigars. So that means you're making 50,000. You got to sell 50,000 to the retailers. The retailers then have to sell those 50,000 to the consumers. The consumers have to smoke 50,000 cigars a day because guess what? Tomorrow you're making another 50,000 cigars. So that's a, that, is a, that is a hamster wheel that when you get on it, you have to just keep running like hell all the time. Yep. Um, yeah. And it's the only way that you can get the cost numbers down to where you can make cigars for six, seven, eight dollars $8. Um, so I really wasn't interested there. And I really don't have the sales team or the marketing to compete on that level with those large companies. So the only place that the playing field is actually truly level is on the cigars themselves. I can make cigars that are as good or better than anybody else. That I can control. So I just decided when I started Dunbarton Tobacco and Trust that that was the only place I was going to focus on. And I was just going to block out all the other noise and all the other opportunities that are out there, just understanding that that's an area that I can't be effective in. So why try to go down that road? That was an amazing with eight minutes of description. Uh, you know, uh, we, we often on this show, one of the things that separates it from other shows, is we get into that business aspect. Um, you've answered like four of my questions right off the bat with that for sure. Um, and and you've also answered the question of you know you know any business regardless of if if it's in the premium cigar industry or not has to make a de- has to make a decision if it wants to go you know wider or deeper or further or whatever cliche you want to use and it sounds like you know you picked where you want to be and you knew what the con- what the opportunities lost or gained 
because you gain time, right? You can't take back time. And then you, you, you also get to know where you're focused, which can allow you to focus on specifically your product. And you released the Sobre Mesa. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. I'm going off the top of my head. Uh, you released the Sobre Mesa, Mi Carita, and Umbagog around the same year, right? Mm, Sobre Mesa was released in 2015, the original blend. Yep. Mi Carita and Umbagog were released in 2016. Okay. Todos Las Dias was 2017. Uh, 2018 was Sin Compromiso. And then in 2019, we added two extensions, one to Sober Mesa, the Brule extension, and then to Mi Querida, the Tricky Troc extension. And then intertwined with all of that, every year I do a, a limited release of Muestra de Saka, which is yeah. probably our most confusing line because Muestra de Saka are all one-offs. They're unique individual blends made in a single Vitola. And they all are centered around some sort of individual unique challenge. Uh, the Exclusivo is only made of tobaccos that have been aged five years or greater. Uh, the one you're smoking now, the Nakatamale, which happens to be one of my favorites, that's a farm-style cigar. Uh, back in the day, cigars didn't have five, six, seven different tobaccos of different origins. Most cigars were literally made out of just two tobaccos, one that was used for the wrapper and binder, and then a second one that was all the filler recipe. And the only way you would give any complexity or interest to the cigar was by how you fermented and aged the tobaccos in it, and then how you proportioned those tobaccos in the blend, and then how you positioned those tobaccos within the cigar. So you had much less material to work with, mm -hmm. but you had to be more sophisticated in the way you blended and worked the tobacco to make it interesting. So one of the challenges to me was to say, can you make a cigar that would live up to the modern day expectations using the way the guys used to do it? you know, 30, 40 years ago and earlier than that. Because um, this advent that we have now, like Sober Mesa, seven tobaccos, Mi Querida, six tobaccos, Sin Compromiso, you know, you know, there's five, six tobaccos in Sin Compromiso off the top of my head. So that was kind of the challenge with that. So, and we do an annual release. And then I sprinkle in a few limited production exclusives, you know, I've done like Red Meat Lovers. Mm. I've done uh, Don Durma. I just did Frog Juice. And, you know, and those are just small little side projects. But I try to be very selective about them because I'm most of those projects are bought by people that really like my cigars and are very loyal customers of mine. And I know that they're buying them blindly. Mm -hmm. They've never tasted them. They're just buying them on good faith. So it's my obligation to actually deliver to them something that is unique and different and exceptional. May not be to their taste likings, but I definitely give them something that they haven't had before, understanding that they deserve that rather than me just banging out a whole bunch of stuff where, oh, I just make a slightly different size or I swap the wrapper on it and I call it something <laughs> new. So, uh, you know, so I try, I try really hard on those small projects. And I've been very lucky with them because everyone that we have made to date, they've all been reordered, which is really rare when you do those type of limited productions. Normally what happens is they get released and there's a lot of hype and the people that got them talk about how great they are, but then they don't ever buy the damn things again and nobody else buys them again. And then they just talk about it for the next 10, 20 years about how amazing it was. Whereas with mine, what's happened is I've done three releases of Don Derma. I've done two releases of the Firecracker. We're doing a third one this year. Uh, I'm on my third release of Red Meat Lovers coming out this fall. And that's what I like to see. I like to see that the cigar was worthy enough that the customers are willing to buy it again. Mm -hmm. And they're also willing to tell their friends that, hey, this is something I recommend you give a go. And then and look, in the, in the end, you can package everything up with buzzwords and story, but and that helps to get somebody maybe to try something. But in the end, it always comes back to the product. Yep. Is the product good enough? Is it worth me spending my hard-earned dollars on to, you know, to, to buy that product again and to recommend to my friends? You can only live for a very limited window on buzz or hype because eventually what ends up happening is you just keep making s disappointing or less than exciting, just not quite as good. And eventually you burn those customers out. They're not going to continue to buy stuff on blind faith, nor should they. Mm -hmm. 
you know, very, I'm very careful when it comes to those limiteds. I've heard uh, vast stories about you walking uh, trade show floors and having um, brick and mortar taken. You were taking orders uh, about them not having, you know, a sample and 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 taking orders and and you know that's all. It's it's category creation, right? You they know that if they put if 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 the, the brick and mortar puts your product in their shop, they know that you're gonna look meticulously take care of the quality put something that the consumers like like honestly when the me carita and the umba God came to havana cigar shop here in warwick Rhode island right mm -hmm. like flew off the shelf like completely yeah. now the umba God didn't for like two weeks and what was weird was um, again, I'm going by both what consumers say and 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 shop owner. It was weird because it wasn't in the same price point as your uh, you, your other two offerings at the time, and and it was at a much lower price point by about two bucks, say Rhode Island, right? So you know it was about to, and so people were like you know is that good? Well, that sock is okay, but like it's cheap. You yeah, know what I mean? What, and, and, what, because what Umbagog is is Umbagog is so. Connecticut Broadleaf is always a very difficult tobacco to source. Yep. You cannot rely on brokers to do it for you because mm. what will end up, and that's what almost all the factories do. They rely on brokers that act as middlemen, whether it be Lancaster Leaf, which is also universal, or whether they're buying it from a leave a tobacco company. And the thing is, those crop cycles go up and down every year, depending on the cycle. How much hail damage, how much blue mold, how much sun there was is going to determine the strength of the tobacco, how much water that year. So it's a very variable crop, and it's really hard to get. So I have to, in order to ensure my supply of broadleaf, I have to deal directly with the farmers, and I have to deal with them in a capacity where I'm basically guaranteeing, I'm commissioning the crop. I'm guaranteeing them that I'm going to give them so much every year, regardless of the quality of the leaf. Okay, but I'm only working with farmers that I have faith in. But I'm always going to have changes because of the environmental, the you know, the, the just the sun, the wind, the rain, yada yada yada. So what ends up happening is, in my perfect world, I would never make umbaga. I would only like to make me karida. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, that's not realistic because I'm getting leaf that I don't consider to be worthy of the quality to go on a me karida. Yep. And when I say not worthy of the quality. Not from a flavor perspective, not from a combustibility perspective, because it's all being fermented in the same pelones. It's the same tobacco, but from an aesthetic point of view. So in the beginning, when Miquerida was first launched, there wasn't very much umbaga. Mm -hmm. But as I make more Miquerida, and as I have worse crop years, there ends up being more umbaga. <laughs> so today, umbaga is something that is reasonably readily available. Mm -hmm. And what ends up happening is I don't look at a product in the way of, Oh, well, Mickey Rita is X, so therefore I charge Y. Mickey Rita and Umbagog are joined at the hip. So for me, if I didn't have Umbagog and I had to eat the other tobacco and sell it on the secondary market that I didn't consider to be as aesthetically pleasing, I would end up basically taking Mickey Rita and the prices on Mickey Rita would be pretty much right where Liga Pravada prices are. Now it would be, in <laughs> it'd be in the $15 price point. Okay. But by having Umbagog as an outlet, it allows me to get a return on the value for the tobaccos that I end up using. So Umbagog ends up being basically a price control product for the other. And I think for even though the tobaccos are very similar and the blends are very similar, mm -hmm. Mike Reed is a better cigar, but I, I have to wonder if 90% of the consumer smoking could really tell the difference in a blind taste. Uh, well, well let me tell you something, Steve. The, the, once the Umbagog boat caught on within that shop they flew like flew and then me carita caught up with it and then the sobre mesa and a lot of ass deal with with the pallets because obviously comparing sobre mesa to me carita is, is totally different cigar it's totally different cigar right but Apples like 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 the me you they they couldn't keep them on the shelf and then you know they, they your your description was much better than the uh, shop workers, not the shop owner, but the shop workers. Like, yeah. oh, well, Absolutely. the Umbagog was named after the do the place you used to go fishing. It was a lake, right? right? My favorite lake. Yeah, it still it, is. Yeah, it was a lake. They used to go fishing. And by the way, yeah. they're me Carita seconds. That's what I, and I'm like, whoa, what do you mean? What do you mean? I'm, I'm like, Steve yeah, Sackett doesn't make seconds. Here's you know? the funny part about Umbagog. <laughs> I'm judging the leaf 
when it's plancha, when it's flat, flat mm-hmm. before it's been stripped. Yeah. yeah. So I'm looking at it as a whole leap when I'm deciding, okay, this is going to go to Umbagog production and this is going to go to Mikerita production. But when you actually get it on the table and you cut out that tenderloin strip, which is approximately, depending on the size of the cigar, the girth, is going to be anywhere from an inch and a half to a two inch wide strip. Sometimes Umbagogs end up being just as pretty as a Mike Rita. Oh, there's no question. You know what I mean? No so, question. But you will get bundles of Umbagog and you'll say, okay, yeah, this is an ugly Umbagog. But the odd, funny part about broadleaf is sometimes the leaves that are a little uglier, they're a little more veiny, they're a little more mottled, they actually have more flavor. Mm-hmm. You know, so, uh, and the thing for me, so, you know, Umbagog is like what I consider my yard gar, my fishing cigar, my whatever cigar, but to my quality level. So in other words, I don't want to smoke a piece of shit because I'm mowing my lawn. I always want to smoke a really good cigar. And so for me, it's kind of like as down the chain as I personally would go. But it still ends up being an eight to ten dollar cigar, so it's not like it's a freebie. No. You're not, you know, you're not, you're not getting a CI closeout for three dollars a stick for a hundred of them. <laughs> yeah. Drew, I know you have questions. Yes, I do. Well, actually, you know, the questions I had was uh, based upon my uh, uh, friends at the uh, lounge, my home lounge uh, over here. So, uh, a couple of the guys wanted to know what when did the uh, Sasquatch, Saka Swash, Saka Swat. Jesus, I give it up. Sack of squash. Sack of squash. Sack of squash. Squash. They wanted to know how that idea came to be. And because they, you know, at so, my lounge, I think we have a couple of them just, you know, displayed around. And uh, it, they were like, hey, it, ask Steve that a, question. It was a nickname that I, so when I worked at JR, I never moved to Jersey because, well, it's Jersey. Good choice. Too many, uh, way too many gun laws and way too many taxes for me. So Correct. what I did is I would I would basically drive down on a Monday and then drive back up on a Friday if I wasn't going to Dominican Republic or Central America or someplace. Um, I had a corporate uh, townhouse there. And one day I got in the truck to drive back north on a Friday and I realized I had left my cigars on the desk. There's no way in hell I'm driving five, six hours and not smoking. If I'm in my truck, I have to smoke. It's like a seatbelt, basically. Yes. I just can't do it. And so I did what everybody does. I picked up my phone and I figured out where the nearest store was. And I went into the store to you know, buy a few cigars. And when I walked through the door, the owner looked up and he goes, oh, my God, Steve Sock is in my cigar store. It's like seeing Sasquatch. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I bought a few cigars. I sat down. I started talking to his locals that hang out in the shop. And it kind of became a habit. Every, you know, three weeks or so, I'd pop in there and shoot the shit with them for an hour, an hour and a half, smoke a cigar on my way home. And uh, they just started calling me Saka Squatch in that store. And that store, uh, regretfully, the owners passed on. The store is no longer in business because we're now talking, what, 20 odd years ago? Good God, it's yeah. been that long. Yeah, it really has. Anyways, so anyways, I have another friend of mine. His name's Jerry Smith. And what Jerry Smith does is he gets cheap shit made in China to sell in the United States. That's his whole job. And one of the things that he gets made is bobbleheads for uh, Major League Baseball and NHL. Yep. So one day he calls me and says, hey, Saka, can you send me a picture of your head? You know, one face on, one from the side, one from three-quarter view. And I'm like, why do you want a picture of my melon? It's like, oh, well, I got something I'm working on. I'm like, what do you need this for, Jerry? And it's like, well, I want to make you a gift. I'm like, well, what sort of gift do you need a picture of my head for? Because, well, I'm going to make you a custom bobblehead, a sock of bobblehead. I'm like, I don't want a fucking bobblehead. Sure you do. already the size of a melon. We're going to make it bigger? This doesn't make any sense to me at all. I'm like, I don't want that. And he's like, you know what? Just send me the photos. I'm like, I'm going to send you the fucking photos, Jerry. And he's like, why do you got to be a dick about everything? I'm trying to give you a gift. <laughs> and I'm like, Jerry, I don't want a bobblehead. But, you know, do you think you could get them to make like a, a smoking Sasquatch figurine doll? You know, that would be kind of cool. You know, yeah, with the gun in it. Yeah, right. You know, I'll ask him, right? Why not? So he gets the Chinese slave labor to make this little figurine. It was a one off, and he gave it to me as a gift. And I got it, and I'm like, whoa, this turned out pretty cool. It like, blew me away how nice this was. So he yeah. gave it to me at a cigar bar in uh, in uh, in Eastern Pennsylvania. 
And the owner of that shop came in and he saw it and he looked at it and he picked it up. And he just started laughing. And he's like, this is amazing. How do I get these to give away as promos with the box? You know, and yeah. I be me just said, well, you can't because this is a gift from Jerry. But Jerry, he sells cheap shit from China. <laughs> so he just walks right over top of me. He's like, whoa, 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 whoa. And he ends up striking a deal with that guy for him to get 500 of these suckers. But because Jerry's my good friend, he sells them to that guy for twice as much as what they really cost. So I ended up getting 500 for free. Mm. So I, so basically the guy got his 500 that he paid for. I got 500 for free. I let the guy do his promo. And when the promo ran out, I was like, okay, well now I have 500. I started using them at events as giveaways for your, okay, I'll get rid of these 500 little soccer figurine doll things and go on my merry way. And next thing I know, Everybody wants one of those damn things. I am literally, <laughs> I've gone through about 5,000 of them to date. Wow. I literally can't keep them in stock. And I keep wondering, when will it stop? When will people like, oh, you know what I mean? It's just, it's so stupid. It's so useless. It serves no purpose whatsoever. <laughs> but is it any different than the shitty cutter they give you for free or the crappy Chinese knife? Or, you know, do you really need a bad ball cap made somewhere in Asia that you'll never wear? So it's another useless piece of crap. But at least this one makes you smile a little bit. And uh, from my end, it's great because people take tons of photos and oh, post yeah. it on Instagram and Facebook. So it's like free advertising. But uh and I've had I've had a lot of people want to just buy them. I actually yeah. have a guy that runs a Sasquatch site. And he's like, yeah, I'll take two hundred of them. I'm like, nah, I, I don't sell them at all. They're just meant as promo swag items. But uh, the Saka Squatch popularity has really surprised me. I could have never anticipated it. That's awesome. That, that, that's such a, <laughs> that's such a cool story. Yeah, you know? I, I wish I could say it was some stroke of marketing genius, but it wasn't. <laughs> you know, sometimes some sometimes you, you, it just works. You know, and and and, and you never know what's going to take off. You know, we, we we've interviewed we've interviewed countless people here on Story Geeks, right? And one of the most I don't want to say hot felt, but one of the most interesting um, interviews I had was uh, Christian Aroa, right? He spent all the time on CLE and blah, blah, blah. And then Tom Lazuka. Now, I, me and Christian crossed like ships in the night between my right. Cigar Club radio experience and my Stogie Geek. Since then, we, we've had an interview. But I actually interviewed Tom Lazuka from Asylum on Cigar Club radio, right? The rep hooked it up and all that stuff was a promo with the local cigar shop it worked out cool and and in christian's word like he literally spent like 27 minutes creating the concept of asylum and right. yet all of the concentration his words not mine you know uh right. an analytical data is on his right. stuff and yet well, asylum goes you. like this and but it goes like this always, that's the way it always is it's one of the reasons why so like one of the problems that i've always had at every company i've worked with is you always are selling a lot of X, but you really wish you were selling Y because you make more money on Y. Yep. So you end up putting all your marketing and your focus and your sales team to try to go get Y to sell more. And in the end, if consumers want X, they're buying X. It yep. doesn't matter what you say. Yeah, you can bump it, right. you can tweak it, maybe you get a little bit of short-lived, but in the end, people are gonna buy what they wanna buy. So one of the things that I do as a philosophy in the new company is, Everything is priced exactly the same. In other words, I make the exact same amount of gross profit on an Umbagog, which is an eight nine dollar cigar, as I do on a Sin Compromiso, which is seventeen dollar cigar. It just costs me that much more to make a Sin Compromiso, and the reason why I do that is because then I ultimately, from a commercial business point of view, I don't have a I don't have a dog in the fight. They're all my children. So whichever one of them wins and whichever one of them loses. They win or lose on their own. And I don't feel the need to try to make one more important than the other. Mm. And it just makes my life so much easier to do that. Because you don't. You have zero control over it. Mm. That's awesome. Yeah, it sounds it sounds like you, you know, you you've you've learned valuable lessons, you know, f as you've gone through your 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 journey and you decide what what you know is, is profitable. You know what well, I, mean? I can like, tell you what the, the one valuable lesson that I didn't learn. I'm too stupid to learn how to make more money because every time I take a new thing and do a new thing, I keep getting smaller and smaller. So <laughs> the apex of my career, when I was with JR Cigar and we were doing a half a billion dollars a year, 
to then step down to Drew Estate, to then now step down to Dunbarton Tobacco and Trust. So I have the absolute worst career path in the entire cigar business. I can guarantee you that. <laughs> it's, it's, it sounds like my career path in advertising, oh. right? I was, with, I was with corporate Xerox. Then I went to the media section. Then I started my own company. And now I'm, you know, I'm here full time at Defensive Intuition on Security Weekly. And it's like, you know, and people are like, you, you guys are that busy at Security Weekly? I'm like, yeah, man. Like, we are flat out. I cannot tell you. And, and, and again, it's, 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 it's maximum utilization of time, uh, efforts, you know. And, and, you know, we, we, you know, I've put, you know, I've sold the, the most amount of, of, of revenue that I made out of an advertising package was Tom Brady versus Peyton Manning, Monday Night Football, $6,000 a spot. We made... Uh, I bought my agency bought 10 spots automatically. I was like, I put it on my American Express because I know they're going to sell out. We'll put it on ESPN, blah, blah. It was a perfect storm. You know, Brady was brand new at the time and all. And I remember my business partner saying, dude, you're crazy. I'm like, dude, if we can't sell 10 spots for this, like, we don't belong as a company. And, 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 and it was the most money I made in one day ever, right? I can and, tell you from a philosophical and, point of view, there's this Nicaraguan phrase. It's better to be the head of a rat than the tail of a lion. And that's something that I've embraced. And um, I'm just tired of having bosses and having to worry about a ton of accountants and lawyers and bankers and, you know, worrying about market share and all this nonsense and consumer studies and surveys. And it just, it eats you, it eats you up alive and where, you know, so what I do now is very simple. I just try to make really good shit and put it in a box. That's what I try to do now. And wherever the chips fall, the chips fall. And look, life is better that way. But no, could I make more money being president of Davidoff? Yeah, but I don't even know if I could get that job anymore because <laughs> most of those uh, top level executive kind of jobs, they are all going to the blue blood MBA guys that look good in three piece suits guys that never use the F-bomb, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I'm not cut of the same cloth as the big as the big players in our industry are going. So I don't even know if those opportunities are even open to me, to be honest with you. I would probably beg to differ. <laughs> but, uh, you know, if I'd be like, we should, probably, we should have another go around. Because, like I said, there, there's so, you know, you, it, it, you've, you've done well. And, 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 like I said, you've created the category for yourself. And in this day and age, with the Internet being what it is and where it is, it's, it's super important. Category creation is so important, not only in this industry, um, but in in other industries as well you know i, I have the luxury to see it in the ultra technical cyber security industry foreign countries i have the the ability to see it here on story geeks and i have the ability to see it with my own company as well and you know at the local level and and it's it's, it's category creation and if your product is a destination or sought after even before it exists i am quite sure if tomorrow you decide to do a press release saying in March of 2021, you're going to release this name, you could, you could start taking orders. You know yeah, what I mean? And, 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 and again, that's category creation. And but I at the same time, I'm not delusional. The whole concept of cigar celebrity is really a falsehood. In other words, you see a lot of brands online, they get a tremendous amount of internet love, but don't actually do commercially very, very well. So the internet love is disproportionate to the reality of the situation. Yeah. And I also understand that for every, it's like literally what, one out of a hundred consumers might even know who I am at all. Cause the average guy he just wants to smoke a good cigar. He wants to relax. He wants to chill at the end of his hard work week. You know what I mean? He wants to sit around with his friends. He wants to drink a few beers. So that consumer, they not only don't know who I am, they will never know who I am. They'll never give a fuck who I am and nor should they. And the sooner that you embrace that and not buy into the concept of trying to become a social media star and you just accept that what you do is take weeds and roll them in a tube and put them in a box, the better off you are in trying to understand how to get, how to be successful in our business, because you can't just 
you cannot live just on hype and marketing and you know exposure. That is only going to get you so far. And we see it constantly repeated in our business where a brand will get hot and it'll be hot for two, three years. And then it'll just kind of wither on the vine. It'll kind of become yesterday's news. And there's a lot of reasons why that happens. And some of them has to do with, you know, the consumers always wanting new, some of it having to be with, there's so much more media and the media always likes to focus on new, interesting stories. So the thing is when you're in that period that you're getting that hotness, you got to capitalize on it to try to reach the average consumer who is never going to follow every little thing that you do. And, and that's a, that's a hard, that's a hard, uh, that's a hard um, environment to navigate. And I think it's one that a lot of people don't really understand until they go through it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But you also have a fraction of the loyal brand. Lo- like, like I, I'm thinking of the Stoy Geeks listener, right? He, he texted me because we... we, we tell you, those we, guys are the hardest to keep. But, but They're the, the ones that are always looking for a prettier girl with better tits. <laughs> You know what I mean? <laughs> sure. They sure. they look, they're they're hot on something now. I mean, you go back to Liga Pravada, the guys that were smoking ligas like Mad between 2007 and 2011, some of them have carried over. Yep. Nope. But the reality is yep. the Liga consumer today is not the most of them are not the same consumer that it was in those early years. They're different people. At the same time though, Liga Pravada is a much bigger widely more successful commercial brand than it ever was when I was with the company. I mean, they're selling easily five to eight times more. I mean, I don't know the internal numbers, so that's sure. me being speculative off the top of my head, just from what I anecdotally see. But I mean, and that's the thing. You have to bridge the gap between that cigar geek consumer into the general conscious of the regular consumer. Yeah. And that's a really, really difficult trying task. Mm. That's a good point. That's a that's a very good point, Drew. I know you have more. Yeah, Drew's yeah, called me every. Drew, Drew never. <laughs> Drew, I, I I always let the story geek listener know, like inside baseball, right? Yeah, Drew has never called me about an interview since he started more times in one week, <laughs> and sent me more notes than you. <laughs> I, 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 Drew, am I lying? Am I lying? He sent me, he no, sent sir. me, he see, he was so excited about your interview. This is true. It's Tuesday morning at 9.01 Eastern Standard Time. Now, he's an hour behind me, right? It's Tuesday. I get an email from Drew. Here's my Steve Saka notes. I'm like, okay. First of all, it's Tuesday, okay? I have to get through Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. I have a little 22-month-old son. It's my firstborn son. Enjoying yeah. everything. Thank you. Enjoying every minute of it. Awesome, right? I'm like, Drew, okay, did you read my e-? Then he calls me at 10, right? Did you read my email? No. I knew it was there. I didn't even look at it. I opened it because I knew you get the read receipt, but I didn't even look at it. Scratch that email. I got more notes. Okay, fine, right? <laughs> Wednesday. Wednesday, right? So, so, okay, Wednesday, he sends me another email. All the way up to yesterday, I believe it was 7.07 p.m. Eastern yeah. Standard Time, Drew goes, oh, yeah. you know that last email I sent you Thursday morning? Now, keep in mind, it's Thursday morning, right? Still, haven't even looked at any of them yet, right? Erase all of those. I I have my final version for Steve Saw. So- I'm like, dude, what the heck are you doing? Like, he spent all week. <laughs> so, Drew, you better have at least three more questions. Uh, between, between, I'm putting between, you on the spot. Uh, <laughs> I'll tell you what. Uh, between Steve and, and uh, Skip Martin, those two guys are like my ultra, you know, those are my guys right there. Those are, that's where I'm from. You know, I, I, just, I love the non candidness. Uh, just, just be what it is. This is, this is, this is what it's going to be. And, and if you don't like it, well then, you know, there's a, there's a ton of other cigars you can go to, but uh, you know, one of the other things that uh, like in my lounge, I started using one of Steve's uh, uh, I think at some time in the past, he talked about dog rockets. And so I started using the term dog rocket. I'm like, I like that. Instead of saying it's, you know, not so good or high quality, I'd say, oh, that fucking cigar is a dog rocket. And they're like, what the fuck is that? I go, you know, I go, I, I go, in my interpretation, that means dog shit, but whatever. So, in my interpretation, <laughs> it's something you would throw at a dog, dog but. <laughs> yeah, it's a dog rocket. Yes. It's, it's a dog rocket, exactly. Uh, hey, I got, so I got Gary Brooks on, on, on here, and he wants, he wants to know, do you ever, uh, uh, do you ever release a cigar like Frog Juice or uh, Dunderma 
in a way that you won't be able to keep up with the demand, but I already know the answer to that. And do you have a cigar that, that was ever made uh, that was a flop, which I think I know the answer to that question as well, but Steve, all right, so that's what, that's the, what Gary. That's first, what Gary wants to know. Of course, all the, the first, flops the, were from the, other companies and not his. No, I'm only kidding. No, no, no. On the first question, um, yes. I mean, if it's a core brand, look, every cigar doesn't matter what it is. There's a limit as to how many Macanudos STG can make. They are just right. at a point now that they have enough tobaccos that they can meet the market demand. But that's something that they have accumulated over decades of time. So every brand I have, there's a limit to how many I can make. But at the same time, if I'm going to make a core brand, a Mi Querida Sobra Mesa, my goal is not to get sales in year one and year two. My hopeful goal is that 20 years from now, your son and your daughter might be smoking a Sobra Mesa. So I'm yeah. very particular when I'm looking at these blends about what is sustainable. Because in the end, the thing that is so critical about a cigar Separate of the construction issues, because construction, burn, draw, combustibility, these are standards that we can all pretty much agree on. Yeah, some guys like it a little tighter. Some people like it smoke a little faster. But for the most part, that's a pretty fixed area. When you get into flavor, aroma, strength, that's very individual. But what ends up happening is if a guy loves Sobra Mesa, he buys it because of what it is in the box. So in order to keep that guy as a long-term customer, it's my responsibility to always make it taste the same to give that guy the same experience when he plunks down his money that's the reason why padrones have become popular you know what you're getting when you buy a 1926 yes. it's the reason why when you buy an opus x you know what you're getting so <clears throat> i'm very cognizant of that at the same time there's no way for me to project how much of anything will ever sell i mean i have a little bit of history a little bit of experience but honestly sometimes it's me throwing darts at a board when I'm doing these production estimates. So sure. those products, I always have more than necessary in the beginning. Now, when it comes to those side small projects, Don Derma, in the first release of Don Derma, we did like 70, 75, 10 count boxes. It was nothing. Second one was like yeah. maybe a couple hundred. Third one was a couple hundred. I mean, it has a weird tobacco from Wisconsin in it. It's very difficult to source in the quantity that I want and in the quality that I want. So that's always going to have a limit on it. But the thing for me is when I release the next release of Don Derma, it has to be the same as the previous release of Don Derma. If it doesn't taste the same and deliver the same smoking experience, then I'm just selling based on prior sales and the name. And then what ends up happening is the guy that then buys it again, he then ends up becoming a dissatisfied, disappointed consumer, which then ends up hurting me overall for anything that I might want to do in the future. So on those type of projects, Red Meat Lover, Frog Juice, look, Firecracker originally, but now I'm making yeah. the Mike Rita Tricky Traka version. So now I'm sourcing oh, yeah. a lot more tobacco that's necessary to make that continuously so I can make firecrackers until the cows come home. Again, to a certain level, there's always a limit on everything, but I'm always cognizant of whether I can make more. And it's one of the reasons why I'm always careful about how I choose my words. Um, I consider those limited production, but look, I'm in the cigar business. Don't, don't anybody out there get a delusional viewpoint of this. My goal is to take your money. Okay. And what my responsibility is to me is for me to make cigars that you're willing to give me your money. Mm. So basically I always try to make things with the intent that I will be able to make them again in the future. I never intentionally limit anything with the exception of one item. I make one cigar in the Moester series called the unicorn and I could make yeah. more unicorns, but it's such a pain in the ass to make them that I just don't want to do the work. And so I only make a thousand of those a year, but even as I'm saying, I have about 7,000 on back order right now. I could make all 7,000, yeah. but that would be defeating of what the purpose of a unicorn is. And in the end, right. How many hundred dollar cigars can you sell for God's sakes? The price on them is so stupid. The cost on them is stupid and the price a consumer pays on them is stupid. And it is what it is. So that's the only yeah. thing that I currently have in the portfolio that I have a, a false limit set on is unicorns. I could make more unicorns, 
but I personally touch every single leaf that's in a unicorn. I inspect every single one. And it's a lot of work for, uh, for me to be sitting there and doing that. And there's other ways yeah. to spend my time. But if I let the factory just do it, then it wouldn't be a unicorn, would it? No. So, you know, <laughs> that's right. so, oh my. Yeah, my brick and mortar owner uh, was just telling me yesterday, uh, he was like, yeah, I just met with David and put in a big order for Dunbarton. And I go, well, did you get any more of the unicorns? He goes, dude, he goes, those are on back order. So everybody here is already sad about that, but everything else is definitely coming by Monday. And so, yeah, so that was, uh, but he, he even put a little, he even put let a me, little note. Let me put unicorn off. math into perspective for the average consumer. Yeah. Unicorns, first off, they cost me an absurd amount of money to make, over $38 a piece. I apply the same gross margin. It's roughly 40% on all my products. At the mm -hmm. end of that gross margin, once I pay the taxes, the shipping, running the office, customer service, yada, 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 whichever places we have reps, as a company, we make a net profit of about 5%. So unicorns, all of them selling every year, if I sold all thousand, which I don't, because I only typically sell about 900 because I end up smoking about 20 of them. I end up using some as gifts. I use some for charity, but let's just make our lives easy. Say I sold all 1,000. 1,000 gives me a gross profit of about $12,800. Uh, my net profit's 5%. So all the unicorns equal about $800 in profit a year. That's the value from a commercial business perspective of unicorns. It isn't shit. It's basically a truck payment in these days. So... I don't want to focus on making a cigar that I know is going to basically, if I made seven times more, I'd make $5,600. Now, not that $5,600 is anything to sneeze at, but the other sure. problem with the unicorn is unicorns come with a lot of inherent risk because when a consumer buys that cigar, their expectations are crazy. Mm, and a lot yeah. of times they save them for special moments, birth of their son, you know, yep. to share with their 80 year old dad on his birthday getting together with my Iraq war buddy that I haven't seen in 20 odd years. And look, if you get a bad cigar of mine, you put it aside, you go, wow, that sucked. But when you get a unicorn that doesn't smoke perfectly, it really oh, ruins yeah. the moment. And look, and I always tell consumers, whenever you buy them, you should always lie to me and tell me it didn't smoke good. Cause I'll give you another one out of guilt <laughs> and you'll basically cut your price in half. But yeah. You know, the reality is I'm always apprehensive when people buy them because of that risk factor with the unicorn. I wish, so I, I wish there were more people like you in the industry because you because because you get the economic indicators and, and you get the factors and you get the point across. Uh, the point is, you have to understand that most people wouldn't share something like that because mm. a they feel like the consumer should know it. Mm. B. Look, I'm in an industry of liars and thieves. It's just part of the way it works. Yeah. And um, I've just been around so long. I just find it easier to tell the truth, mm -hmm. whether or whether it makes me look good, makes me look bad. That way I don't have to remember what I said. Yep. You know, it just makes life so much easier when you talk as much as I do. That's actually if I were to ever write one of the top five philosophies, that would be in the top five. Always tell the truth and you never have to worry about what you said. Uh, you know, to, yeah, to actually anybody. stupid shit all the time, yeah. but you know, I just look, you have to own it. It's just the way things work. Mm. That's it's, yeah. impo it's impossible to be in today's society, particularly to be active on social media and to really engage. And that's one of the things that, you know, when you look at the way I do social media, I actually get into conversations back and forth. Now, most of mine stay in the cigar realm. I don't really dip into politics or religion or current events very often um, because gotcha. I just don't think people give a damn what I think about these things. Um, but, you know, I really do try to have an ongoing back and forth style of conversation. And some people would say that's genius. Uh, I don't know. It just is because, look, that's how I got into this. I was active on AOL. I was active in Usenet communicating yeah. directly with other cigar smokers is what led me to doing what I currently do. So it's just in my nature. If I didn't have a cigar company, I would have a, I would have a Stogie Geeks podcast. I would have a website again because that's yeah. just what I like to do. We want to yeah. start a panel. You want to be on it? No. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> I, already knew that. I already knew that answer from the get-go. Yeah. 
You want to be the host? Hey, uh, it, it, no. it, it could be you. It could be you and Drew next week. I'm sure. I'm sure. I'm, I'm sure a lot of people in the industry would love to see me go. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know, part of the problem is I have to be. Look, I have opinions on everything, just like every other human being. But I also have to kind of measure my words sometimes. There's a lot of things I'd like to talk smack about that I can't talk smack about because it would just be inappropriate for me to do so. So I, I try my best to limit my smack talk about my own glass house and not to expand it beyond. That's great advice for uh, the world. <laughs> you should be on CNN instead of st- or one of those crazy news. To which uh, pick one. I don't want to get political, but but you you should be on mainstream media with that. What the hell yeah. are you doing on Stogie Geeks? <laughs> Yeah, those guys go down too, man. Uh, yeah, that's true. That's, it's too yeah. rough an environment these days. I, I always say to people, if Mother Teresa was online today, she would have haters. And it's Mother <laughs> Teresa for God's sakes. You know, she's helping the indigent and the poor, and she would have people that absolutely hate her. Now. That's that's so, a that's a phenomenal <laughs> point. That's a phenomenal just, point. Just, I'd be lying. I'd be lying if I didn't use that and say that. But I will always give you credit. Yeah. I would say when I was hey. on Story Geeks. I interviewed Steve Soccer, and he said, and I agree with him, if Mother Teresa was on the internet, she, people would still hate her. That's oh, bad, yeah, it would be awful, man. It was, it's just, look, and, it's, and you have to, and that's one of the reasons why it's so much easier to just be who you are, own who you are, mm-hmm. be comfortable who you are, for all the warts and all the ugliness and all the bumps and whatnot. I'm not saying go out and be an outright dick all the time, but at the same sure. time, you you can't you can't put on a facade or a face endlessly. Mm-hmm. You can't do that twenty four seven. No, you can't. It's physically not possible. Look, and I have my moments. I have crazy rants that you know <laughs> that literally I would be they would, they'd be lynching me off a tree for. Okay, and deservedly <laughs> so because we all say stupid shit all the time. It's part of what we do as 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 a human being. You know, and it's a it's a difficult it's a difficult environment to operate under. And it's not like in the past where, yeah, just two or three of your good friends heard what an idiot you were. No. Now the entire world hears what an idiot you are. And it gets saved for 20, 30 years postmortem that anybody can go back and see what an idiot you were. Mm -hmm. That's that's a that's an impossible environment to operate under as someone that's, you know, has some sort of public interaction. It really is. And I'm hoping that this kind of cancel culture that we're currently in, eventually everybody will come to the realization that that's unsustainable and they'll be a little bit more forgiving of their fellow man and give them a little bit more wiggle room. Because the other is, if you don't, then everything you're going to get is going to be vanilla. Everything is going to be corporate advertised. Everything is going to be focus grouped. Everything is going to be blah and bland. And that's not life. Life isn't blah. Life isn't bland. And I don't think that's what any of us really, truly want in our hearts. Mm. And boy, we're going off the rails here. No, we're this, about some I'm, cigars or some tobacco I, or this something. Is, uh, this is like this, this is like church on a Sunday morning. Well, well, I haven't been since COVID because it's closed. But you know, <laughs> this is like this is like church. We get we get out. You know, it's like it's it, 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 it's so true, right? It's it's like all it, just everything you said. It, it's 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 you just seem grounded. You know what I mean? And what I've noticed from interviewees or what I've noticed in, in my industry, pick one, right? Doesn't matter. You, you know, you, 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 can, you can tell when someone is externally centered versus internally centered. And you seem very, uh, tremendously internally centered. You're comfortable with yourself. I've even used the phrase walking around my house, like I, I like being Joe Hosempa. Like, you know what I mean? I, I love it. Like, I, you know what I mean? I mean, I get to freaking talk to, so I get to smoke new stuff because it gets shipped to us all the time. All these new companies ship us all the new stuff. Uh, I have the placebo effect multiple times. I've even spoken to people about this where I'm smoking their stick on their show that they sent me. And I'm like, holy cow, this is phenomenal, right? I'm speaking to the roller or the blender or the owner. And then, you know, six months later, you catch up from the consumer side and you have it. And you're like, dude, this thing's, to use Drew's word, what is it, dog rocket? 
Dog rocket. That's Steve's that, you know, to, word. Oh, all right. To, 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 to you, to, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a dog rocket. And I'm like, why? And, and believe me, I can rattle off days where I've been like, holy cow. Like, I actually like this stick on that day. You know what I mean? But but well, it, it, that's it, the thing that consumers have to always understand about all reviews and media is that you're really getting someone's opinion in the moment. Mm -hmm. So you should use it as a tool for you to identify things that you're interested in trying, but I would never take any number, any rating, any opinion as sacrosanct. Mm -hmm. I mean, in the end, you have to just let the cigar speak for itself to you because, and I know like, look, the guys that love my Totus Las Dias, they're probably not sober Mesa buyers and they're definitely not sober Mesa Brule buyers. Yeah. There's a few guys that play the field and like to have, you know, mild cigars and then really spicy cigars. But that's not the way the bulk of the consumers work. They have a certain strength. They have a certain taste profile. They have a certain experience. And they zone in on those cigars that fit their needs and best serve them. And so you always have to take every review and every statement as a little bit of with a bit of a grain of salt and end up making your own opinion. Mm -hmm. Drew, if you don't have yeah. any more questions, I'd like to direct more towards um well i have one more yeah no, no, i was gonna say okay, total to, 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 those dias is way is definitely one of my cigars that, that I, I i have a box on hand pretty much uh when when nomi has them in the store i just go grab a box but mm -hmm. uh yeah because I, li I love that i love that cigar because that's a cigar that for me um you know and i like like neanderthal and stuff like that so uh i like the really heavy heady cigars and for me right. that's a you know knock you in your butt not right, you like, you know, a, put you like a punchier kind of smoking experience yeah exactly and that's that's a cigar i definitely gravitate to uh if not twice you know three times a month uh but i have a question here uh on the pulpettas uh is are you doing that or is that for the common fan or are they event only that comes from tio ho ho uh yeah. he's on well, he's online with us and he wants so to know he, that so here was the deal with pulpetta pulpetta was I, the name was inspired by the event that I do with two guys. I've been doing this annual meatball competition with them where I get forced to make meatballs. Mm. And, uh, oh. I've been blessed to win two <laughs> years straight. And um, Nice. So that's where the name came from. And then in the past, when we would do events, we would basically let the consumer pick five other cigars, but they were the same cigars we're making and putting in boxes. And we've been struggling to keep up with sales so it just didn't make sense that I keep giving away five of whatever the guy just bought. So I wanted to make sure. an event only cigar. And so okay. my plan was back in 2019 when I started making Popetas was that it would be the giveaway cigar, the bonus cigar for all our 2020 events. And I made quite a few of them because we were doing a lot of events and then COVID happened. And yeah. now I have a boat ton of Popetas and my original plan was we were going to use them for events for all of 2020. And then when I got to December, if we had any left, we would then take the balance of them and just make them available for retailers to buy with the intent of there being a new 2021 event cigar. So that's what was in my brain. But mm. now that the COVID thing has happened with all the shutdowns and all my events have been canceled for me and all my guys, um, yeah. I'm not quite sure what's going to happen with Popetta. Will we start doing events in July and we'll go through them all? Will I get to the end of the year and I'll still have more than half and I'll carry it into 2021? And, or, you know, so I, I haven't actually decided, but okay. that was what my original intent was, was to use them in that way. But as to how what will end up happening when we get to the end of 2020, I'll have to make a decision there. And I got to tell you, a lot of it's going to have to do with when Nicaragua opens because yes. I'm unwilling virtual blending, the nonsense where I send a factory an email and tell them what to do and then send me samples and then taste them out of Ziploc baggies. It's just not how I work. I like to be at the bench, knife in hand, tobacco in hand. I like to make all my own blends before I pass it on to the factory. And I can't make the 2021 event cigar if I can't be there. So if I don't end up getting to Nicaragua, until August, that's going to be kind of like the cutoff. That'll be like the last time I might have a chance in order to be able to make a 2021 event cigar. So I honestly don't know. There's just there's just too many unknowns right now. 
Nice. <laughs> I don't even know where to begin. I'm getting texts and emails. I'm getting. I'm. 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 I'm not gonna read them off. I'm. I'm. I'm not. I'm so not interactive. But I'm like, this is weird. Like I'm getting. Uh, Russ uh, text me and says, "Thank you for having that legend on." His words, not mine. Thank you for having. Yeah. Thank you for having that legend on. You know what's funny is Let I him, don't view myself in that way at all, uh, dude. <laughs> I have I have talked about you. I've never met you like physically other than 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 it than this. I have said, dude, if the stories are true, he's a freaking rock star in the industry. That's it. I mean, but I've always said that since I've heard your your walking down the uh trade show and and taking orders without samples and all of that story. So, you know, um that's it's a rock star. Uh, that's just the, so we, that's the way it's described here in the Northeast. But this gentleman's from Florida, always a listener to the show. He frequents cigar shops in South Florida, and he's been trying to get me to move down in South Florida. He's like, you could take Story Geeks to the next level if you go there. I'm like, dude, I, I, my significant other is from South Florida. There's a reason why she moved up here to the Northeast. She's like, we will never live down in Florida. But anyway, uh, he said, uh, thank you for having that legend on and let him know that, that the hand rolled was amazing. Does that make, does that, does that mean anything to you? No, they're all hand rolled. So, uh, 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 yeah, Russ, you need to re, uh, define your, your, your email. So send that to me. Uh, there, and then I'm getting a text saying, "How the hell did you get Steve Soccer on?" The answer, is, the answer is pretty simple. Drew asked. <laughs> yeah, but look, I'd be an idiot not to do them. It's free. Look, I, I don't follow the media the way I probably should. Um, so I actually don't know the viewer numbers and who's hot, who's not hot. Yep. And my attitude is, whether you have a thousand listeners or you have three listeners, why wouldn't I take the opportunity? to talk to those people. I mean, look, I'm trying to grow a small family business. So the, the answer is simple. The thing that I'm a little concerned about is because of, again, going back to C19, there've been so many of these podcasts. I just, I have to yeah. wonder how bored people are not just seeing me, but seeing all of us because it's been just relentless. I mean, I did one yesterday. I'm doing this one with you today. I have another one on Monday. And for everyone I'm doing, I'm telling other people, listen, I'm already booked. You know, maybe we should start talking about September and October because, I mean, it's almost too much saturation. Mm. And I know that people that listen, eventually I end up sounding like a broken record. And there's just no way to avoid it. I mean, the head's big, but there's only so much that can come out of this cranium. <laughs> so I, I, always, I always worry about how it is for the consumer that's listening because i don't want them to be bored you know you 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 bring up a good point right like when we went where, where i was pivoting anyway is like the future of our industry right and you know these podcasts are now getting more and more frequent but it's not just the cigar industry podcast it, 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 it's 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 a, it's a great media outlet but when you look at the when you nobody look likes at, to read anything anymore right they want to watch everybody, it everybody and, would rather have a video or a podcast while they're in their car driving from point A to point B in the background. Yep. Uh, you know, it's just, uh, it's just, just the nature. And as the demographic skews younger and younger, you're going to see even more of this. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things that, you know, it's really interesting because I was talking to a group of young consumers and, you know, one of the reasons I've never done it on my own is because it's a lot of work, mm -hmm. you know, doing the editing, doing the production, doing the technical end of it. It's real. It's not as simple as everybody thinks it is. And they said to me, you know what? You shouldn't even worry about that. Just do it raw. Do it on your phone. That, you know, our kids our age, and when I say kids, I'm talking 30, 35 year olds. Yep. What I'm talking about when I say kids, they're like, we don't care about any of that. We really just care about whether it rings true. Does it feel authentic to us? And, uh, and that's something that, you know, works to my advantage. I'm not, uh, I'm not a very packaged product. So, mm. Yeah, it, it's 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 amazing, right? Because now when COVID hit, you get a lot of these these um, social outreach efforts, right? Because you know we were all in lockdown and quarantine and whatnot, and now all of a sudden, I can't scroll through my whatever the main feed or whatever it's technically called to go through without seeing somebody on a Zoom 
a and, virtual herb, uh, a virtual whatever. herb, for anything like very that. Very few of the virtual herbs. I just yeah, I'm, no offense to the guys that like them and enjoy them. Mm -hmm. I just find them boring. I I, I do too. I I showed up to one. Uh, I was texted. Uh, it was one of my original um, sponsors uh, who sponsored my radio show. So I was like, right. yeah, I'll show up. And, and, you know, it was a Friday night, you know, 7 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. My kid goes to bed at 8. So I was like, all right, I'm going to log off at like 7.30, but I'll jump back on. And then I stayed till like 9, right, after my kid went to bed. You know, I did the bedtime routine that we do, mom, dad, read, blah, blah, right. blah. Got to wind him down to ensure sleep. Thank God he's a sleeper, right? So anyway... And then I jump back on, and I got off at nine thirty, and I was like burnt out. Then come to find out from the comment, they were on until one o'clock. Like what the heck? Like it's crazy. Some, and, of, some of them I've seen have gone eight, nine, ten hours. Yeah, and and and, and I mean it's cool like there, but it's just it's just I don't know. You I know think, what? The guys that enjoy them, great. They're there. You mm -hmm. can take advantage of them. If you don't enjoy them, don't do them. Yeah. What I wonder is, there's two things that are very interesting about the way this year is shaking out. And you have yeah. to understand from my end. A lot of cigar companies are not doing well in this situation. This has not been good for them. For sure. All of these store closures has really put an economic pinch on them. So, and they're unable to do their normal on the road, in the store, their event cycles. They're not doing any of those things. So it's a way that they feel that they can at least be proactive to try to keep their brand at the forefront of consumers' mind. And I don't blame anyone for trying to keep their company afloat. And then the other thing, too, is, you know, this year we don't have any trade shows. Mm. You know, TAA got canceled. IPCPR slash PCA got canceled. Now the Dortmund International Show has been canceled. So this is going to be a really interesting year to see how does this work in an environment where you're not doing all of these trade shows, you're not doing all of these in-person events. How is that going to impact sales? Because doing all those things are incredibly expensive and incredibly time consuming and honestly look we go to the trade show we sell about a million dollars well there's not going to be a trade show i'm not going to sell a million dollars in three days that's not happening this year but i won't have that expense either so if i sell if i sell 400 or 500 thousand dollars that month i may actually do better not having done the trade show for sure. And this is right. something that we always ask ourselves as manufacturers, but you're afraid to take the risk because uh -huh. you don't know what the result is. Well, guess what? This year, we don't have a choice. Mm. We're all mm. taking the risk and we're going to get an answer. We're going to find out, hey, is it really worth doing all of these things that we have just been doing over and over again because it's what we do? Mm -hmm. It's that old mm -hmm. adage advertising works but you you know 50 percent works 50 percent doesn't work but you don't know which 50 percent, so you do all of it and it's the same scenario with us you just keep doing more of the same because you don't know what's the real reason why things are growing and things are shrinking so it's, it's going to be a, it's going to be a very interesting year from a business perspective i also think now also it's it's i know it sounds crazy but it it, it it's allowed the business to kind of almost pause and go in like slow motion, maybe like a matrix motion to create a visual or, or an audio for those of you who are watching us or listening to us. Right. And, and, and they can kind of make a decision at a much slower pace because they're being forced to. And right. what I've known from being a small business owner since, since 2004 is that, Sometimes you go year after year and the numbers look good or bad on the year and you're like, holy cow, like that was like two years ago or, or whatever. And now it's like, okay, it's, it's a little bit more of a slower pace, a little bit more of a calculated attack. You know, if you were going to use a sport analogy like golf, right, you're, you're 80 yards and you have the green and you can see the green and it's a straight shot. But you got some bunkers and maybe a water hazard in between there. But you got you. It's not like you're taking out your driver and you just got to get two change out, right? You you gotta you know you you gotta go out there and and I think it's gonna be a more calculated. But here but here's where the dilemma comes in. The hazards are not fixed. In hmm. other words, so like right now for us as a company, we're actually we're actually doing better this year than we've ever done. We're still growing, which is unreal, hmm. and we've done it without any of the discounting at all. We've done none of the crazy. The only thing we did is uh, we uh, offered some soccer swatches to some of our retailers because they would have all been used at events. 
So we let them do them yeah. in their own stores. Um, so we've done it without having to go down that road. And yet our sales are are up. We're currently, I think last I looked, we're like up 24% year to date. Mm -hmm. And it's not mostly to the big catalog guys. Yes, their sales have gone up, but they've gone up in proportion with our brick and mortar guys um, because we didn't do deep deals. And look, and I don't blame those guys. They are trying to get the best price they can for their companies. Um, so it's really, but I, I keep wondering, look, we got 40 million people on unemployment. At what point is someone going to look up and go, damn, I don't have a job and unemployment's going to run out. And I really can't afford to buy those Saka cigars because they're also overpriced. You know what I mean? So it's really hard to have any feeling as to how this year is going to work out. It's uh, we're, we're in really uncharted territory, I think, in every business. Now, luckily for us, look, you're not spending money on sporting events. You're not spending money on travel. Most people aren't spending money on gas because they haven't been traveling to and from their jobs as much. They're certainly not spending money on restaurants like they used to or in the bar. So you know what? They're spending more time on their back decks. You know, yeah, okay, $12. I get two hours of enjoyment out of it. Maybe maybe we're a little bit insulated, um, but I don't, I don't know the answer. It's going to be, like I said, this is going to be a very intriguing year, and I have no way to know mm. where we're going to end up. And look, it makes me nervous. And also, this is the year where this FDA stuff is going to really shake out. That September 9th deadline is now a hard deadline. The courts have refused any further extensions. But on July 24th is the big case about um, hearing the crux of the matter, the substantial equivalency requirements is going to go before the federal court uh, towards the tail end of July. And that's going to have a huge impact, particularly on a company like mine. Um, not as much on a, you know, now it's not going to have an immediate impact because I'm filing my substantial equivalencies and who knows when the FDA is going to look at them and how they're going to rule on them. So maybe I could be in the market another year, two years, maybe indefinitely. I mean, the FDA is saying they're going to pay no attention to them. We're going to be the lowest on the pile, no enforcement. But it's a big, it's a big who knows what's going to happen. So there's a lot of, this is a very tumultuous year uh -huh. for our industry. And then and, and look, it's a very tumultuous year, I think, for all small businesses. And even the mega companies in our industry, most of them are still relatively small businesses in the grand scheme of things. I mean, uh -huh. The whole, whole industry isn't worth a billion dollars in the handmade segment. Right, right. What do you think about the uh, future of the industry? You know, taking... I think a lot of it's going to depend on how this substantial equivalency shakes out. Yep. I mean, it's going to make a big difference. I mean, I can see a scenario where it ends up regretfully going all to big companies only, commodity mentality. Everything is done entirely based on, you know, on the PNL and on the quarterly reports and what the shareholders are getting. And, and if that ends up happening, then sadly, as a cigar smoker, it, it isn't good for me as a cigar smoker, as a businessman, it's a disaster, but look, I'm, I'm okay. I'll figure out something else. I'll become a hand model or make soap or some nonsense. I'm not going to start. And, uh, but I mean, as, as a consumer, I don't want the industry to march in that direction. I don't mind that that segment of the industry is there for those customers, but I'm not that customer. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Not that Jim Beam isn't a fine thing to get a buzz on, but I'm buying Jefferson's Ocean. I'm buying Colonel H. Taylor. I'm buying Noah's Mill, you know, when I'm going to the Bourbon Isle. That's what I want to drink. I'm willing to pay more because I want something that's a little more interesting, a little more unique, something that more effort's been put into. That's who I am as a consumer. And if the cigar market all marches down to that level where it's only that commodity based, that's not going to be good for me as a cigar consumer. Mm. Now, let me say this. I have the benefit that, well, hey, every year I'll go to Nicaragua and I'll, I'll make five to 10,000 cigars for me to smoke, but I'm not going to become a, I'm not going to become a bootlegger. I'm not going to try to find a way to avoid federal regulation and taxes. I'm too old for that shit. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. That's not where I am at my stage of life. So I'm hoping that there's a pathway that's going to allow me to continue doing what I want to do. 
but there's no guarantee and it's all going to come down to some some people that wear pajamas for a living as to what ultimately ends up happening because our congress doesn't have the stones to do what's right they fucked it up in the first place with the crappy tobacco control act the way they wrote it they left it to an agency to determine how to interpret it and it's been a mess ever since and they know it's a mess but they're not going to go back and fix it because, well, it's Congress. And I don't care whether you're on the red side, the blue side, or what side you're on. We can all pretty much universally agree they suck. They don't do mm-hmm. much of anything that ever turns out good at this point. Mm-hmm. So I can't look to them to provide us any sort of resolution whatsoever. So essentially, it's going to come down to what the courts determine. And this court thing has been dragging on now since, well, I mean, it started way back when they first pass the Tobacco Control Act. But for us as an industry, it's been pretty hot and heavy since about 2016. Mm-hmm. Yep. So we'll, we'll see We'll see what happens. It's gonna be, it's gonna be an interesting year. It certainly is. You know, I've, I've often said that if it goes the way that it's written, it's going to affect the consumer, no question. Like yeah, but it's really hard to get but, the consumer motivated to intervene. I mean, we always ask them to contact their congressman. Yeah, but the that's- problem is, it's an endless battle. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And I understand why consumers get tired of it. How many times can they write the same letter, yep. make the same phone call, and it feels like nothing ever changes? What I would say to them, though, you have to understand that it does have an impact. And they're not, they're not, you don't have to worry about writing something flowery or long or well thought out. You just have to let them know how you feel about the issue. Because all they're doing is putting tick marks on a piece of paper saying, Yep. Against. Yes. For yep. against for against for. Yep. So it can be as simple as literally one sentence, two sentences in an email to your local representative. And that actually gets your word heard just as loudly as if you wrote a 22 page dissertation. Yep. And look, we're on our end in the industry. We're writing those 40 page, 50 page reasoned arguments as to why this regulation is unjust, ineffective, ill, ill conceived. That's for us, but the consumer reaching out does actually make a difference. The consumer does make a difference. I've I've said often on previous episodes that pre my professional career for Xerox, my first quote unquote professional job, I've had the luxury to work for a congressman who was United States House of Representatives here in Rhode Island, and we switched jobs when he transferred to Senate, and he's still in Senate here. It's Senator Jack Reed, and I remember sorting, at being the low man on the totem pole, right? Uh, I was still in college at the time. And, you know, I had to wear a suit and tie and white shirt and shave all the time and, and do all that there. And I remember literally going through, at the time, it, it wasn't so much email because this was 1995, right? right. And, 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 you know, I remember just saying, you know, these are for, these are against. I would sort all issues. Like, we've had... Development issues of a development yeah, it's windmill. I mean, it has nothing to do with the cigar industry. But when you write those templated letters, you're better off flashing an email with some catchy three sentence, two sentence to, ca- to catch their eye than to take, again, any organization that's organized and sends us an email, copy and paste here, send this tweet, do all of this. Because all they're doing well, is just calculating but if tweets. You're not, but if you're not going to write the three sentences, you're better to do the template. Mm-hmm. Then do nothing at all. Right. If that's if those are your choices, just anything that you do helps. And look, it's difficult from our end because look, when you're imploring a consumer to do that, look, it's definitely self-serving. I yep. mean, it's self-serving for me, you know, and that's part of the issue is you're basically asking them to lobby on your behalf. Mm-hmm. And <laughs> I don't, I, you know, look, it's just what it is regretfully that's the environment that we're in today i but, wish it wasn't this way it was so much easier than our entire involvement with the federal government it used to be we pay them a nickel for every cigar that's what it used to be that was it and that's right. the reason why as an industry we were never engaged on a political regulatory level because it was unnecessary and it wasn't until that s chip tax got proposed and the original s chip proposal was a ten dollar tax on every cigar. That was actually what was written in the original bill. It wasn't a typo. And that's what then all of a sudden set off this whole getting us involved in all of this. And I have to be honest with you, I hate it. Mm -hmm. I mean, you you meet with, and here's the other thing. Once you start talking to these senators and congressmen, I think there's only like maybe one out of five, two out of five that have a brain. 
most of them are really pretty fucking stupid. I always <laughs> used I always use the phrase when I'm in in cigar shops or my world or life or whatever. It's see student politics. Like the politicians I know, like gut C's and and you know the ones that got A's stayed clear out of politics and did whatever they did in their respective field. You know yeah, what I mean? You can actually make a living the other way and not be miserable. Sure. And, and another thing that, that, that strikes me differently, and, it, and it's no testament to any of the organizations that try to get the letters going out or anything like that. It's, you know, they asked me, uh, and this happened, it was Wednesday I was in a cigar shop. The day I didn't come in here. I think it was Wednesday, right? So, because all the days blur in now with all this COVID, right? And, and I was saying, they're like, oh, wow, you know, never more is it divided. You know, it was, it was talk of the cigar shop. We're sitting outside. We have our mask in our back pocket, all this stuff. So you got the visual, right? Uh, and, and, and I says, you know what the problem is? The problem is with politics, and it's not a, like, again, any of these organizations. When you have people who elect the electorate, you have 13% of the people who are voting the president or 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 local legislator who actually actively participate i don't know an industry that doesn't cater to 87 percent of of its of its audience right if you if you look at the u.s population who doesn't cater to 87 percent of the audience and survives you know what i mean like that's the problem with politics i don't care what color you are which side you're on what you believe in anything there i always in my cigar shop rules, I don't talk Yankee, Red Sox, baseball, politics, sex, or religion. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? I don't. I don't. I, I just don't. I just don't get into it. Right? But <laughs> but when I was speaking to this other guy, who was a congressman who came in, and 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 we were talking, and you know it's weird, right? The congressman comes in, and then 13 minutes later, the state comes in to make sure that we're spaced and because Rhode Island had its, it, it, its reopening. So it's day three of the reopening. The state shows up, make sure everything's all set, this, that, bing, bing, boom. And it's like, they hate this guy. That's why the state's here, because they want to pop a couple of businesses to set an example. And the reason why they want to pop a couple of businesses to set an example, which is the reason why you have other issues going on global, uh uh, within the United States is because you only cater the 13% of your population is actively involved. So 87%, like if you ignore 80% of your, if you, Mr. Saka, ignored 87% of your target audience, your target right. audience, where you were going, you would be having a much different conversation on Stogie Geeks or any other podcast that you're on well, no, yes, about your position in business. People that like to smoke really great cigars and they're not then they don't concern themselves that they cost a couple of dollars more. Mm -hmm. That's my audience. That's black, that's, that's white, that's green, that's women, that's guys, that's 68 year old dudes, it's 32 year old dudes. That that's my audience. You know, that's who I, it's one of the reasons why like I always whenever I see a brand come out that's like made for a certain demographic, mm. I always look at it and I kind of like that's never going to make it because nobody likes to be put in a box that oh well, this is a cigar made for women, or this is a cigar made for black folk, or this is a cigar made for white rich guys that play golf. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's yep, it's yep. just it's condescending and it's stupid, and it's not really how people think or function in real life. Mm -hmm. And Speak it's one of the reasons why I, as a as a company, I don't even buy into the whole lifestyle advertising thing. Like I got to define who my consumer is, and then all the advertising is going to be targeted to who I think the guy is that's buying my cigar because the reality of life is you don't know who anybody really is until you actually really know them. I mean, yeah. you know how many rich guys I know that they just wear t-shirts and jeans and sneakers. You know how many guys that are like stretched to the limit and they're dressed like to the T in this thousand dollar suit, but they don't have a pasta pot to piss in. So you, you can't, you can't take things at a superficial level. And that's the reason why in the end, I always just go back to, it's about the tobacco. It's about the cigar. In the end, that is what is going to have to live or die on its own. Because if you're relying on marketing, in the end, it, it won't be successful. Mm -hmm. What's not, your... not, not in my segment. Look, when you become Bud Light, well, maybe the, the world is different. But, you know, I'm, I'm 150 years away from being Bud Light. <laughs> <What's>... <laughs> I understand. Um, what's your take on... Uh, it happens at your level. Uh, you're an owner, 
uh, uh, you know, an, an owner of a cigar company. It happens a lot at the consumer level. What's your take on the definition of what type of, because what type of cigar company you are, not what you stand for. Because what happens, what I notice from doing interviews, we interview the big guys, you know, we, we've, we've gone... We've gone up there with, uh, you know, some big companies, and we've done really small, small batch companies and whatnot. What's your take on what I've noticed more in this industry from the three years that I've been here? I've been here since January 2nd of 2017. Um, I make that date noticeable, so any Story Geeks listeners who go to storygeeks.com can check the date of the episode and know, you know, which version? How much you sucked on that day? Uh, what, oh, I'm, uh, <laughs> let me tell you something. I've gotten. I could not pronounce Araparaca for like five months. Paul was like, "Araparaca." It's Arapiaca. What? Arapiaca. Oh, I still Arapiaca. can't pronounce it. Well, yeah, what? it's Arapiaca. <laughs> it's Arapiaca. Yeah, Arapiaca. Oh, I thought it was a Araparaca rapper. No, Arapiaca. Damn. I still, okay, so to this day, I still can't pronounce it, right? <laughs> but, <laughs> Arapiaca? Arapiaca. Arapiaca. Oh, yeah. I corrected Drew like four or five episodes ago because Drew couldn't pronounce it. I said, don't worry about it. It took me four months, and I thought I, I knew what I was doing. Somebody's going to text you now and say I'm saying it wrong, too. So. <laughs> hey, who cares? <laughs> All right. So, so anyway, like, what's your take uh, uh, us consumers, right? Because I always look at it. I, I, you know, when I when I walk into a lounge, I don't like, hey, I'm from Story Geeks, you know. Well, I don't, I'm so low key with 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 that type of stuff, and I listen to their conversations, and they want to get into, hey, you know, because everybody you visited lounges on a whim, where you know they just want to talk to you about like what they're smoking and what they enjoy, which is the sure. pleasure of this industry, which is great for you because if they don't have a visual as to who you are. You can kind of, hey, what do you think? I'm still going to a lot of cigar stores. They don't know who I am. You know? So, like, what's your take on us as consumers, not Stogie Geeks, but us as consumers, they got to batch the cigars in categories. Did you notice, like, a categorization? Like, I'm boutique or I'm classic facing or I'm small batch or I'm... Uh, you know, you know, and and it's they're like all, they're I'm all like, just words, though. In the end, I at mean, the end of the day, I'm like, my yeah. opinion is just smoke what you like, right? I and mean, just remember the name of what you like, so you can tell your friends of what you like and why you liked it. And maybe if you want to get into just the region, you don't have to get in the rapid binder filler. But you know, because there are some people who. What like, I always tell consumers is find things that you like, and then find out what factory made that cigar. The actual factory mm -hmm. and who was the blender of that cigar yep because what typically happens is factories produce a certain genre like if it's made out of papin garcia's factory my father mm -hmm. 90 plus percent of what he makes is going to be spicy racy lean peppery because those are the bulk of the products he makes so it's the bulk of the tobaccos that he grows or the bulk of the tobaccos that he sources so if you like cigars from my father then you say okay well what other cigars are made at my father and then you start saying okay well which cigars from my father do i prefer do i prefer the ones that are branded my father that are being blended by papine and Heine, or do you prefer the ones that are from pete johnson at the made at the same factory but they have his own personal viewpoint on it you know like agronosa that factory they make their own brands for agronosa leaf they make cigars for dion at illusione they make cigars for uh, for Warp. They make cigars for Nicholas Melillo at Foundation. But each of those individual blenders and brand owners have their own particular spin on it. So once you start identifying who are the blenders that you like and what factories they come from, then it'll start separating from just the brand alone. Mm -hmm. And you'll start to actually get a better understanding and what's probably more in your wheelhouse and not in your wheelhouse. It's one of the things, but look, it's, look, it's, it's luckily today. It's much easier. Thanks to the internet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You can find a tremendous amount of information just using Google and it'll help you sort that out. And the media sites help tremendously too, because, you know, sites like coops and half wheel and developing pallets, and I can list another 22 of yeah. them. They give you a lot of details. There's a lot, there's a lot out there 
for the consumer that wants to engage at that level. For the consumer that doesn't, that just wants to relax and have a good cigar, ask their shop owner, hey, what do you think? What do you recommend? And the question shouldn't necessarily always be what's new. The question should be really, well, what haven't I tried? Because just because something's been on the shelf for 10 years, if you haven't tried it, well, it's new to you. And there's a reason it's been on the shelf for 10 years. There's a lot of people that actually really like that cigar in order for it to be there. Uh So, you know, the new part, even though it sounds good, isn't necessarily always the best because the reality of the situation is 90 plus percent of what's new, it dies within the first two years. Yep. If you go back and you look at any of those top lists from five years ago and see what the top tens were on them, I guarantee you half of those cigars on any of those lists aren't still on the shelves to be bought. And if they were so amazing, then why aren't they still on the shelves? <laughs> right. You know? Yeah. They, they couldn't have been yeah. that amazing. They just were the flavor of the moment. And, you know, you, you don't want to spend your money on the flavor of the moment. You want to spend your, mo- your money on something that's a relaxing, enjoyable experience. Mm. That's actually the second time that someone has given me that advice. First time, one of the oldest cigar shops in Rhode Island, uh, I was there on Wednesday. So, yeah, Wednesday was there. I wasn't. Uh, it was their last day. They're moving. So they're taking two weeks off, and then they're moving just down the road um, to a bigger store. But they've been there for 40 years. So clearly, I'm only 45, so clearly I've known this store since its, its existence. Frequented that store when I first started my business and whatnot, and, and have had multiple times there. And one of the things that she told me back in, I think it was 2009 off the top of my head, she, you know, she was like, well, what do you like to smoke? And me, I'm all over the map. You know, I'm all over the, you know, to every, and then she goes, well, we'll give the names. And then, and then I gave the names and she goes, do you know that nine out of your 10 are from the same factory? And I was like, right. I never realized that. Like, and since then I've owned a cigar shop, right? But again, I've owned a cigar shop on a 56K dial up. So there's is a, it's a different it's a different mantra. We didn't do no online advertising. You know, right. we, we we advertised in the penny pincher, had our little five dollars off coupon if you spend twenty dollars or whatever, and and, and 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 move on that way. You know, but it's like, and she's like, you like this factory, and and so that's the second time that that's happened to me. That's interesting. That, that that's sound advice because I've always said it multiple times here, or to other people, is is to define that. And because you will get a product that you like for whatever the thing too as a consumer, it takes quite a few years for you to dial in what you like. Mm. Yeah. Because your yeah. tastes change over the years. You're gonna go through these different phases and eventually you're gonna settle on the formats that you like. You know, you may have only been a Robusto guy, but once you start playing the field a little bit, you start to realize, oh, you know what? I really do enjoy a, an occasional Lonsdale. I really do occasionally enjoy a perfecto. And you'll also find that you'll move up the strength scale. A lot of guys will move way up the strength scale. And then eventually they dial it back just a little bit. So where they may have been into the really super heavy powerhouse biting style cigars, they don't stay there all the time. Some guys always stay there. They never go back. Other guys, you know, are like me that, you know, depends on my mood. Yep. There's times yep. that I really want to smoke a sober Mesa Boule. And there's other times I want to smoke a Mike Rita Tricky Traca. And the more experienced you become, you start to learn what is right for you. Yep. And you become a better consumer and you save a lot of money because, look, we all have hundreds of cigars, if not more, in our collections that we bought in the moment because we love them. And then three years later, they're still sitting in the humidor and you're going, they're still good, but they don't excite me the way they did. Yep. So as much as this is going to hurt my own business and other businesses, I always recommend to consumers when they get into cigars, don't, don't go hog wild crazy buying everything and chasing everything. Give yourself a few years to let your palate kind of settle out so that you're spending your money more intelligently and you don't end up having vast collections of good cigars, but they're just not good for you anymore. Mm. That's actually great advice. If I go into a humidor that only has, 100 facings or 80 facings right or i go into a humidor that has 600 facings right i i always take about five to ten minutes in the humidor because it, it depends on my mood it, mm-hmm. it, that that's such sound advice i'm like ah eh, because i there's a lot of guys that they go in the humidor and all they're going to grab is a bit drone right they're only going to grab an oliva v look that customer i don't have much of a chance of reaching that guy 
he's found what his cigar is. Um, the thing though with that customer is they tend to be in an older demographic and they eventually all die. And what ends up happening is look, Tiamo used to be the number one selling cigar in in on the East Coast. Yeah. Can't put Tiamos anywhere anymore. Couldn't Macanudo used to be the cigar that was flying off the shelves. Yep. It's not that Macanudos aren't as good as they used to be. It's just that consumers' tastes have changed over the years. Yeah. So whenever you're at the top, eventually you will end up slowly losing customer share. It's just it's it's just just the nature of our industry. It's funny you say, Tiamo. When, when I own the shop, I'm like, why can't we keep these on the shelf? They fly. And I'm like, I don't like do my only complaint about Tiamo. And again, I'm not picking on anybody. I'm just sharing the moment, right? Is it's got to be a thinner wrapper because to me, they smoke too fast. Regardless of if you guillotine or bullet, I've, I'm, I'm a bullet or, or, or V cut. Right. right. And, and and I'm like, Tiamo, they, they taste so good, but they smoke. This is then when I was like, they smoke too damn fast. And now they're gone. You know, you see, you know, it's, it's amazing. That's what I feel about Padrones. Padrones smoke very quickly. Yes. Yep. Yeah. And I don't think it's I don't think it's so much the tobacco. I think it has more to do with the bunching style. Um, I don't know about current Tiamos because I haven't smoked any in quite a few years. So I, I haven't don't. either. Yeah. But I still smoke Padrone and. But drones, they, they, they bunch them a little looser. They bunch them a little lighter. They're not as densely a path. So as a result, the cigar burns a little hotter. Uh, the draw is a bit more airy, and it smokes quicker. Now, that me saying that isn't a negative. That's just a trait of how they make cigars. And you as a consumer, you get to decide whether you like that or you don't like that. Yep. And the reality is a lot of people like it a lot, and that's uh -huh. the reason why it becomes as popular as it is. Um, but you, you, you start to you start to figure that out because every factory is a little different, every blender is a little different, and the more time you spend in the beginning, it's all about discovery. But eventually, you get beyond the discovery phase, and then you get to the point where you start becoming much more discerning about why you smoke something, and and that and that and that for me is really kind of the customer that I that I'm targeting. If we're going to talk about targeting a consumer, for me, the more experienced a consumer is, the more educated a consumer is, the more likely they are to eventually become a Dunbarton Tobacco and Trust cigar smoker. Mm. Um, you know, but for the guy, look, I'm never going to compete with the guy that's, you know, getting closeout deals at, you know, super prices. I can't, I can't, yeah. I'm never going to reach that customer. Right. And and also, I don't really think there's a reason to smoke a Sin Compromiso if you can't appreciate the difference. Why spend $15, $16 on a cigar if you can spend $8 and you're perfectly satisfied? Yep. You know what I mean? So I don't, I don't, there's no need to drag somebody up for something that they're not really going to get value out of either. Mm. In economics, we call that marginal utility. That's a very fancy term. It is. I have a degree in economics, ironically, and political science and chicken out of law school. But, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's called marginal utility. You and, and it's amazing because I remember being in college and, and we, we, we did a case study and it took a semester and blah, blah, blah. And you can mathematically calculate the amount of joy people would get from bigger products and, you know, economies of scale. Like Twix bars or Bud Light or anything like that, and, and 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 I remember thinking to myself, like, this can't be right because it's just putting people again in categories and boxes to calculate. That's what the big companies do. But 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 but, but that's exact. But to to my point, that's exactly what the companies do. Is they say that if we put X amount of advertising in this effort with this demographic and do that, we're gonna push this product and it go. And I'm just like. <sighs> I, I, it's cool, but sustainability always changes. There's probably you know? only in our industry in the handmade segment. There's probably five companies that think in those terms. You know mm. what I mean? Mm -hmm. I mean, yep. there's a big difference between the big corporate-owned companies and the family-owned companies in their approach to how our business is operated. And I'm not saying it in a way to be negative of the large companies. Because the reality is the large companies serve more consumers. Um, there's a lot of customers that really love their products and smoke them religiously. And they're and look, in the end, it always comes down to one simple question. 
Are you happy with your purchase? Do you feel like you got value for your money? That's the, you know, all the other stuff, the branding, the demographics, the stories. It always comes down to that one basic, simple question. Am I happy? Am I pleased? And, uh, you know, and, uh, and uh, you know, there's a, there's a large group of consumers that they really like some of those brands. For me, I find a lot of them to be a little bit homogenized. I don't mean homogenized tobacco, but I mean, it's always just kind of in the middle. You know what I mean? They're, they're trying to make something that's going to please the most amount of people. And, and I understand why they're doing that because that makes good sense for the scale of business they're in. Where on my end, I kind of have this, I have this adage I've said a million times that when you make a cigar that everybody likes, you've ultimately made a cigar that nobody loves. And I know that the consumer has thousands of options. So I'm hoping to get 100 people to try the cigar. And all I need is just one or two of them to really love it and to add it to their rotation. That's what I need to have happen. Whereas when you're a big company, that's not what you need to have happen. You need to have a far larger audience adopt the brand and smoke it regularly. So when they make products, they focus group them. You know, they make a blend, they get 20 people in a room, they give them a pencil, they you know, videotape them. Well, what do you think? You like the strength, you like it this. But the thing about cigars is everybody's perception is different. One guy's strong is another guy's too mild, you know? And so what ends up happening is they try to make a product to make as many people as possible happy. Whereas what I'm doing is I'm making cigars that are diversely different, hoping that the consumer is eventually going to find the one that's right for them. So it's, it's a much different approach, but I have the luxury of that approach because I'm small. I don't have 1700 employees that need their paycheck on every Friday. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yep. You, you can't, you know, it's one of the conversations I always have, you know, people talk to you about Liga Pravada. Look, life was much different when I was involved in making Liga Pravadas. Liga Pravadas did not move the bottom line of the company. First year, we sold 270K, second year, 400, third year, 800. You know what I mean? None of our paychecks were dependent on Liga Pravada. So it let you kind of take a position of being high and mighty and on your horse. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Because we were living on acid money. Acid's mm -hmm. what kept everybody employed. And, you know, but things change. When Macanudo becomes a brand that you sell $15, $20 million a year, and you've got 400 people in your company that rely on their paychecks because of Macanudo, well, then it kind of changes how you have to approach it as a brand and as a production. And so it's, it's, it's definitely different in the long run, you know. And that's one of the things that I think uh, the consumers – they don't have to deal with the business end of it. And that's not for them to worry about. That's the problem that we're supposed to worry about on our end. But in the end, the consumer is always going to choose what's eventually they will end up getting to a point that what's best for them. Mm. Drew, do you have a, I have two quick questions for Drew. Drew, are we doing sticks or no? Because that determines no. how. I, okay. All right. No, and, no. Then, and then. Uh, do you have a couple last questions for Steve, or what are you doing? No, I'm I'm good. I'm enjoying I'm, I'm enjoying this, and uh, oh, this is amazing. Uh, yeah. All uh, right. You know, uh, just want to let you know, Steve, Andy Johnson. He just wanted you to know that uh, he thinks you're doing these interviews are good, and seeing your interviews are getting to and getting to know you uh, makes him want to try all your sticks, and he's uh, he's absolutely uh, pleased uh, mm -hmm. with your for time orders. Orders. Well, that's yeah, also a, a positive of, of, of these podcasts, even though your schedule They is, work the other way. Some guy uh, sees me and thinks, man, that guy's such an asshole. <laughs> Never mind it. <laughs> so it cuts both ways. <laughs> right, right. Sure, sure. Yeah. Absolutely. What do you think uh, – so now we have a little bit of time. What do you think that, um, like, the industry as a whole, do you think collectively we're going down – a right path. I know FDA has a lot of that. No, I think we're yeah. a little bit on a wrong path because of the way the FDA legislation is structured. It basically encourages people on my end to basically sell you the same thing that they claimed was new seven years ago with a new story and a new package. Mm -hmm. And that isn't, in my opinion, good for the type of consumer that I am. 
You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So it doesn't serve my needs as a consumer. Does it serve the general populace? Maybe it does. I mean, the thing about that is when you go down that path, it makes everything cost less, which makes it more economical to the consumer. So you could interpret that as being good, but it sucks the life out of uniqueness and diversity and expression and you know all the things that I made me fall in love with handmade cigars. I mean, just how just such little minor differences in how we change the fermentation, when we decide to do the primings, you know, how we decide to plant that tobacco, you know, what seed, what fertilizers, what that particular crop cycle is like, you know, in the barn, we're going to go with this humidity level versus that humidity level, all these little things that we do to try to create something to make it unique and different and interesting. The regulatory, uh, the regulatory guidelines, they really want to suck all of that out of it. They want it to be very simple, very straightforward. And to be honest with you, it really just serves the interest of the large companies. It's basically a, it's anti-competitive as far as I'm concerned. Um, but we're going to, you know, what I think about it, we'll see what the courts think about it because they're going to be the ones that end up ultimately making the decision. And you have to understand that those large players, and I don't blame them for this, I would do the same thing. If I was running a big company still, they're lobbying for the things that are in their best interest. They're not going to lobby in what Steve Saka's best interests are. I wouldn't expect them to, you know? So that's the part that I don't like. I I hate to think that we're going to become an industry of widgets, Mm. You know, because if it just gets to that level, then what's the point of it? They're they're missing the whole thing of what makes handmade cigars so beautiful. It is that diversity. It is, look, not everyone's going to smoke perfect, no matter how much care and effort and time and quality control. In the end, it's a handmade product made out of an organic material that's unadulterated. There's going to be some variance. It's the way it works. And, you know, we as consumers understand that and embrace it. But, you know, that's not the way the regulations are written. They're written to favor the companies that do things like they're making widgets and not actually making handmade cigars. Takes the craftsmanship completely out of it as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. And, and, I, and I don't like that trend at all. Yeah, I, I don't like it either. And I have, I, I've often said that it's, it takes away the creativity, the future creativity. Of and what, here's the funny what part products about haven't that. been created yet. It actually hurts the big companies too, because it's the small companies that are making the unique individual stuff that keeps the consumer so engaged. Yep. Okay, and that's what helps to create lifelong cigar smokers. That eventually, those large companies are hoping to have as customers. So when you get rid of the tip of the spear. And those products, even though they're a very small segment of the market, you're going to lose that way to funnel in. Same thing with brick and mortar stores. Nobody becomes a, a Cigar International or a JR Cigar or a famous smoke shop. They don't start buying a whole box of cigars. They need to have that lounge cigar store experience. You know what I mean? When they first get into it, they need to have that first time walking into a human or going, oh, my God, I had no idea there were so many different cigars. You know, and have the chance to play the field and try these different things and hear recommendations from their tobacconists, hear recommendations from their friends. Nobody just starts off buying from the big box guys. So the big box guys, they need the brick and mortar guys also. It's mm-hmm. very intertwined in a lot of different ways. And regretfully, so many people in our industry have kind of balkanized. But I guess I shouldn't be surprised by that because we've gone that way with politics where everybody's kind of in their own little tribe mentality and not really thinking about the overall good or benefit. And part of that has to do with a lot of the large companies. Even in the day, the large companies were still family owned, the Coleman's own general. Okay. Even Altidus. Okay. It wasn't a family owned company, but the people that were at the top, they were all employees that worked their way up through the company and earned their shares. They were very connected. We're now the people at the top of these companies, most of them are professional C-suite executives. You know, that's what yeah. their career path is. They're not cigar guys. They're not tobacco guys. They're, they're C-suite guys. They have MBAs. 
They're currently an executive at a cigar company. Well, guess what? Three years from now, they're going to be an executive at a liquor, liquor company or an executive at a digital media company or something like that. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It's not the same. And the problem with that is everything is always on the short term. And we're in an industry that nothing is short term. To make really unique and different cigars, like Sin Compromiso, it was five years in the development of that cigar for the tobaccos to make Sin Compromiso. Well, how do you have five years worth of expense look like it makes sense on a balance sheet <laughs> for something that you don't even know if it'll ever sell one cigar? It could turn out to be a flop from the moment you put it on the shelf, when instead you can take a perfectly good blend that you have plenty of tobacco that used to sell as brand X and now make it into brand Y and sell it again with none of the R&D costs. You know what I mean? None of the risk factor, you know? And and even if it does still fail, you didn't put all that time or all that investment or all that effort in into it. You know what I mean? And it shows up in that annual cycle on the reports for the for the shareholders, it's a much different environment, and um, and for me, that's the part of the industry that I'm okay with the big eating big and getting their share. At the same time, though, the small and the little is necessary to funnel for the big, uh-huh. and too many of these companies, even though they know it, because they're not stupid people running these companies, but it doesn't matter to them. Because the people that are running these companies, they're going to be at a different company three to five years from now. They will either be fired because they suck, or they'll be really good and they'll get promoted to a new position within the company at a different level, or they'll be really, really good and they'll go out on the street and get a better job in some entirely different industry. And that, that to me is the part that I find very disconcerting as a consumer. Um, I know your schedule is getting busy. But, and I'm making the, the calendar date up uh, sometime in September, October. Can we do a segment again on um, which types of tobaccos get? Yeah, we, we, like such... maybe we do a podcast where we actually talk about cigars and tobacco. <laughs> <That'd> be... <laughs> well, <laughs> you, <laughs> sir, you're on the road. Every, everybody watching this thinks, oh, why don't people smoke this dude's cigar? You got no, no jack shit. No, actually, actually, <laughs> for, for, for the for, oh. for the for the for the volume four of Stogie Geeks, <laughs> you're completely like in the arena of where I keep or where I go to immediately for all of my conversations. Like immediately, I go to to the business part, and and because at the ultimate end of the day regardless of how much i can't even say a ara- arapia arapia era piaka think you era, know like era baseball, baseball cap yeah. new era you yeah. know how to say an era baseball cap right era piaka era piaka so era. just start off with new era baseball cap yeah. era piaka i love to talk about that and geek out a little bit about that mm-hmm. uh well, just a little thing on era piaka so era piaka <laughs> is so it's a it's it's a Negro tobacco. It's from the cigar family of black tobaccos. It's a derivative of the Matafina seeds, but it's actually grown as a cigarette tobacco. It's not grown as a cigar tobacco. And one of the reasons why it's so popular with cigar makers is because you don't have to commit to the entire crop. They will actually let you go and cream the crop. Where if it's Connecticut Shade or if it's Mexican San Andres Negro, you have to use all of the cigar tobacco because it's used it's used exclusively for cigars. But what Arapiaca is grown for is primarily grown as a tobacco to be used in heavy cigarettes. So what the farmers will allow you to do is they will allow you to go in the crop and say, oh, I'll take these leaves and I'll take those leaves and I'll take that leaf over there. And you don't have to buy the whole crop and figure out how to use it. So it's a very economical tobacco to use for a wrapper on cigars. And when you have shortages in Connecticut broadleaf, which are difficult to get, and you have shortages in San Andres Negro because of its popularity, Arapiaca gives you a mechanism to get a heavy, full-body Maduro-style tobacco to be utilized on a cigar. And it's one of the reasons why it's become so popular. Mm. Yeah, no, that that's... Uh, I've... My definition would be, I can't pronounce it, but it's freaking tasty. <laughs> and so, in the end, that's all you have to know, right? Uh, uh, I always tell uh, consumers, you know, it's, there are consumers that are interested in knowing everything, but ultimately, you just have to judge the orange. 
is that orange sweet? Is that orange juicy? Are you happy with that orange? You don't have to know how the orange tree is grown. You don't have to know how to be an agronomist. You know what I mean? You don't have to know everything about the orange to know whether the orange is good or bad. So for the consumers that are interested, I love having those conversations. Okay. It's more my wheelhouse, but ultimately as a consumer, for you to determine whether you enjoy something or not enjoy something, you don't have to know any of that at all. Mm -hmm. You just have to decide what you like to like to taste and what you like to smoke. Yeah. But I would love to to be educated on that type stuff too. there too. Um, for sure. But I, 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 I often go to the business things because at the end of the day, like you said, uh, I put leaves in a box and sell it, <laughs> you know, it's all brown and round, my friend, you know, <laughs> which, which I think, which I think is, is, is it's well said for sure. For sure. Absolutely. So, yeah. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll flash you an email um, later on next week and we'll get on your calendar. I'd love to do a, a a little bit more. You guys are in Rhode Island, so I, I could probably come and do it in person. Uh, that would be awesome. That would, you, you were in studio last time. For you Stogie Geeks listeners, um, if you go to uh, stogiegeeks.com and type in episode 196, that was when uh, Steve was on first, and you were actually in studio. But obviously, I wasn't that good because we got to 331 before I was invited back. So that should say a lot. <laughs> no, no. Honestly, honestly, the, pa- <laughs> the, 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 the past three years ha- have, yeah. been, have been bandwidth. Like, Drew has been a, a blessing in setting up the interviews and, and doing all that outreach and all of that because we're so – entrenched here now you know see before when i used to just do security weekly and report here once or twice a week to do my i'm sorry when i used to just do my story geek stuff for the first year i was in story geeks i was doing a lot of the outreach like drew was doing and whatnot then paul hired me full time to come on as security weekly and i've been pulled literally pulled out of my stogie geeks um responsibilities and, and put into this arena too so the outreach just hasn't been on even drew pinged me yesterday oh have you heard about this guy i'm like yeah i heard of him he's like dude he lives in your town like the cigar <laughs> he lives in your town and you've never met with him he's like yeah are you from bristol I, go, I live in bristol he's like dude he he's he's in your town i'm like we got to get him on the show and i'm like i, I gotta I'm, I'm, you I'm know my him. my vp uh dave lafferty he's, he's a rhode island boy yeah, Dave Lafferty. That sounds familiar. Yeah, Dave Lafferty. Yeah, he used to he used to be. Uh, I don't know his official titles, but essentially he was like really important at Drew Estate, mm-hmm. and then he was really important at Nat Sherman, and now he's really important with me, but he gets paid a hell of a lot less. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, he's on the same negative career path. I don't know what he's thinking, but well, uh, anyways, uh, he he's he's an interesting guy. You ought to you ought to reach out to him. He's uh, okay. he's far more entertaining than I am. I can tell you that for sure. Yeah. Yeah, awesome. But yeah, it's been a pleasure having you on, and and thank you for 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 being candid and 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 getting those business points across that I think that not only the Story Geeks listeners have listened to because that sh- the show itself has transitioned from rapper behind the filler and all of that stuff to more of a business function, and the, the numbers are there. Yep. So you know, well, what um, we can do is next time we can focus on uh, on the cigars. Yeah, you know, yeah. And talk about different bunching techniques and different styles of tobacco, and, and we can we can pretty much talk about anything you want. Sure. You 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 have a quick ten minutes, Drew. You have a quick ten minutes, Steve. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. All right. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, what goes on in your head when <laughs> when no no no? I've asked this question all the time, right? Because <laughs> okay. because we'll see where this goes. <laughs> no, because because <laughs> a lot of the story listeners love this question. It's like their favorite question that I ask, and I try not to begin the interview with that because I want to keep them listening, right? It's about numbers, right. right? What goes on in your head when you're trying to create a blend? So, for example, we could start. We could use your 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 mi carita. So, but there's three, there's three basic ways blends get developed. Okay. Okay. The first way is you have a particular tobacco that you're interested in and you want to focus on. So that ends up being the linchpin that you end up doing all the development based on. The second way that it happens is you have a particular genre. I want to make something that's a a pepper bomb. You know what I mean? You You have an idea in your head as to what style of cigar that you want to make. 
The third way, which regretfully has become the most common way, is the marketing weenies in the United States say, well, such and such brand over there is selling really, really well. So we need to make something that's like that brand for us. Yep. And then they just tell the factory, hey, we need you to make something that tastes like X, Y, or Z. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, the way I have approached most of what I've done has been more about trying to make a certain genre. So, you know, Sober Mesa Brulee, Mild the Medium, Connecticut Shade, Smooth, Buttery, Sweet. You know, that was kind of what I was thinking. Mi Querida. Mi Querida is probably the type of blend that I'm best known for. Connecticut Broadleaf, medium to full in strength, very full flavored, heavy body, a little bit of dirtiness, a little bit of grit to it. You know, taking Mi Querida and saying, oh, I wish it was just a little bit denser. So developing the tricky traca deviation of the Mi Querida, you know, Sin Compromiso was more centered around me wanting to use uh, a Cultivo Tanto crop. So that one was really spurred more by the tobacco wrapper that I wanted to use turned to be the catalyst for that particular brand. So those are really kind of the three ways. For me, it's only the first and the second because the third category, I'm too small to care about trying to make something that tastes like somebody else's to compete with them. So I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not in that league yet that that's become an issue. Um, but those are typically the three starting points which most blends are created. And every once in a while, rarely, a factory will come up with something on their own and pass it to the overlords in the United States. And they'll say, okay, yep, let's figure out how to market this because we think it's really, really good. But that happens so, I mean, the story gets told all the time that yeah. it happened. Yeah. But the yeah. reality is it just doesn't happen that often. It's really quite rare. Yeah. Yeah. I've noticed that from interviewing week after week and, and doing that. You can kind of, you know, stay away from those conversations when, when they go there. You know, like, oh, it's a such and such spinoff. <laughs> right. You know, but one of the things you mentioned, too, which I think is, 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 is great testament to the small batch or the, the tip of the spear, as you described it, is that you keep the big companies on their toes. Exactly. Because That's what I'm saying. The, the innovation of the smaller brands yeah. are what forces them to continue developing. Because the reality is, and this is the same thing with retailers. Look, companies and retailers are lazy. Mm -hmm. You know, if customers are coming in and they're buying brand X and they're just buying brand X that forever, they have no reason to go out of their way to introduce you to something different, unique, or new. Because the retailer, he makes the exact same profit on every cigar in his store. You know what I mean? Yeah, right. he might have his friends, and he might have one he made a little bit more money on, but for the most part, he doesn't actually care what you take out of the humidor. He's he push really sticks. doesn't. Yeah. You know. It's the same to him one way or the other. And I always say to retailers that their business is their front door, not their humidor. You know, it's a question of how do you get customers to come into your shop to buy cigars from you? Now, the makeup of your humidor is part of the factor as to why customers come in. But in the end, what they pull out of there. So if there wasn't someone being innovative, there would be no change ever. And that's the reason why I go back to why I don't like where the industry is heading with regulation. Yeah. that we just will end up with everything being kind of some sort of facsimile of one another. And that's not a good scenario for me. Right. When I see a classic facing try to mimic or even regionally mimic, uh, go to a specific region that, that, that they're not well known for it. The first thing that comes to me as a consumer is, oh, well, imitation is a great form of flattery, right? Yeah, but let's be real. I mean, handmade cigars are essentially being made the exact same way they've been made since before the turn of the century, 1870, 1880. So there really is nothing that's truly unique. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I mean... But what uh, about that, the that, tasting? Like, uh, you know, like if, there, if there's this flavor profile that comes out from this hot new flavor of the week or whatever... And well, that's where you see the innovation. You see it on the tobacco side. Look, I, I have this adage that I know the part that everybody sees the factory and the, and the Torcedor, the Rolera, and the Bonchero, and it's very romanticized. The reality is <laughs> yeah. those people just fuck up good cigars. That cigar is a good cigar that you're basically, you're handing them the tobaccos. You're handing them the blend. And what they have the opportunity to do is to mess it up is what they're doing. 
So the part that gets so heavily romanticized because it's the part that takes the sexiest photos is actually not the part that really matters. The part that really matters happened long before those tobaccos ended up on the bench. Mm. Because the, 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 when you get to the point that you're actually making the cigars, that's just an opportunity to screw up perfectly good tobacco and perfectly good blends. That's what that is. And you're just trying to make sure they don't muck it up is what you're trying to do. Mm. Awesome. That's a good point. Yeah. That's a good point. Steve, I want to thank you for your time. It was a pleasure to actually get a chance to speak to you. Finally. No, pleasure's all mine. Thanks. You know, and, and Drew, thanks for reaching out to, to Steve for sure. Oh, yeah. Any final comments, Drew? No? No, not at all. No, not at all. Uh, yeah, satisfied just, uh, with the interview? Steve. Don't call me oh, yeah, like in 20 you. minutes and say, I wish I asked him this. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> No, uh, and you know, and I'll and I'll say this, you know, a lot of the people, a lot of the people that are watching the, uh, a lot of our snow geeks that are watching the show now, they're like, no, this is great, this is inter- this this is something very interesting, uh, on the backside of the business, and so they mm. get, they really get a forefront from Steve, you know, what you know what it's like back there as a businessman. I mean, because there's that dream of you know a lot of these guys, that they want to get in the cigar industry, uh, but you know, uh, they're finding out very fast. You're not going to get in it because you're going to get rich. You're going to get in it because you're you're passionate about it, and that's one thing that comes through. You don't get you don't uh, get in these interviews. Our business, you get you get quick for. But I don't want to say that to discourage someone from doing it either. Yeah, everybody starts off from zero. I mean, Padron they used to make cafeteria grade fumas. But for one day, they were a company that was on the verge of bankruptcy for thirty plus years. You know what I mean? It takes it takes a long time and a lot of effort. But the thing about our business is. We package it in a way that makes it romantic. It's all fancy boozes and hot Latin chicks and all of this <laughs> nonsense when the reality is it's a very working man's grinded out blue collar business. It is. That's oh, what yeah. it is. And it's it's a dirty, hot business. And um, it's not something that uh, it doesn't come well in a it's, it's hard to market. So nobody's going to market that part of it. But that is the reality yeah. of it. And uh, it's a lot. It's a lot more difficult. So you have to pretty much go into it. A, an overnight success in our industry typically takes about ten to twelve years. Mm-hmm. And for every company that starts, regretfully, most of them fail. Um, yeah. And to put it in perspective, so during the boom years, that stretch from ninety four to ninety seven, there were over three thousand new cigar companies in the market, and. And that was the wow. time when it was the easiest. You could basically just roll up shit and could sell. Okay. It didn't matter what it was. Consumers were desperate for everything. Retailers were desperate for everything. And look, on the other side of that, what? Maybe 20 of those people survived out of 3,000. You know, uh, right. it's, got a, it's got a really high attrition rate. So I don't want to discourage anyone. But at the same time, you got to go into it with your eyes open and, and understand and um, mm. and you got to pick the right people to talk to because the reality is most of the people that you interact with, they're either salesmen or they're tobacco guys or they're factory guys. There's very few people that have an understanding of the entire curve of our business. You know what I mean? They only have expertise in the one segment and you're not, you're not going to get a complete answer from them. And so you just just be judicious is all I'm saying. But at the same time, exactly. I'm hoping someday to be a big company. So I don't want the small guy to not be there because he's going to be the one that's creating the innovation. I'm going to need him just as much as those big companies yeah. need me today. So, you know, circle of life, Hakuna Matata. I never said that in my life. Yeah. Oh, oh my God! God. <laughs> like we gotta it. end this, man. This is going off the rails for sure now. Nah, like I said, this is no, no, no. One more, one more quick question because, uh, because we've asked our other uh, previous interviews. Like what about time. your son? What the fuck? <laughs> no, I think it's, it's beautiful. It's beautiful, Steve. It's beautiful. Oh God! So how's, All right. how's <laughs> Steve? How's your son? Is your son is your son interested in? Not only staying in the business, but continuing the, you know, your, your, your art while I the family's hard okay, work. So we're going to have a really like heart to heart on this one. I actually feel mm. very guilty bringing my eldest son into the business. 
Um, and the reason why is he had a perfectly good career that I derailed him from <laughs> to bring him into this shit show with this oh. regulatory nightmare. Um, and uh, I have given him multiple opportunities to walk away gracefully and to float him out of my own pocket. You know what I yeah. mean? Uh, to, to, to try to undo the damage that I have done. And uh, he keeps doubling down. And uh, so, and, and I will say, you know, in the beginning, he was more an employee. But as time goes on, he's becoming more integral and he's becoming yeah. more involved and expressing more interest. And one of the things that, you know, and this is actually a disservice to him. He, he's not really like learning at the knee. You know what I mean? We're such mm, a small yeah. company that we all have our responsibilities and we're all overwhelmed with them, yep. you know? So at some point, if he continues to express the interest level that he has, I'm going to have to get him more involved in the tobacco and in the manufacturing and in the factory aspects of it. Um, for, because, but at the same time, I desperately need him to do what he's currently doing. How long you know has your son I mean? been with you? With Since company? the inception of the company. Okay. So Dude, he's been with us for so five years. We should do an episode. Yes. What the hell is it like to be Steve? To have Steve Soccer as your dad? That sucks. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like, you know, is he camera uh, shy or anything like that? Or um, You know, <laughs> I don't know that he's shy, but he's not. Uh, look, he, he doesn't have. Uh, he isn't as. Uh, he isn't me. How about that? What's his responsibilities within the company? Um, he handles all of the logistics and distribution, the warehouse end of yeah. things, uh, you know. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, look, it's it's and that's one of the things that people those things are just as important. Customer service, right. logistics, invoicing, you know, it, it sounds so tedious and like who cares. But those are the things that impact your customers and not talking about my consumer customers, yep. but the retailers who buy from us. And look, yes. one of the problems that a lot of retailers don't do business with small companies like companies our scale is that they're just used to what a shit show it is to do business with those companies. It's a pain in the neck. They can't ship anything right. They can't invoice anything right. They can't get credit memos right. They can't do RMAs correctly. <laughs> and look, all of those things are important you know, in the long run as you're a growing right. business because- you want to do business with people that make your life easy to do business with. And look, when things are super hot and they're flying off the shelf, it's okay. You tolerate that nonsense. But when things right. even out, who the hell wants to put up with that bullshit? Nobody wants to put up with that nonsense. So you have to focus on all of those basic business things that are really essential to any wholesale distribution business. So you have to have a grasp on that, and that's something that John is integral in. Mm. Nice. I, I, I would probably err on the side not knowing anything about your son or anything like that or his age or anything like that. If my father was in the cigar industry, and I, I'd give it a shot. What the hell? Roll the dice. You know what I mean? If not, he can, uh, can always sleep on his couch. You know what I mean? I'm pretty there. sure Cindy will say, I'm pretty sure Cindy will say, no sleeping on the couch, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, thank yeah. you for your time, Steve. Um, I will be emailing you. I'll email you over the week when this this will be uh, ripped and produced. I'll be honest with you. September, October, I have no clue what's going on then. Yeah. Um, but... Uh, well, if so, you want to do it before then, that's fine. Uh, yeah, I mean, we, we're going to have to wait to get a little bit further into the year for me to even know what's going on. Gotcha. And I can tell you right now, with the FDA deadline being September 9th, I won't commit to anything prior to that date. Yeah, that's small. Because I, I know that those last six to eight weeks leading up are going to be a bit of a nightmare. You'll be doing some yeah. traveling. No, I think I'm going to be spending a lot of time dealing with attorneys is what I'm going to be doing. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. It's It's... I don't know. I, I I have often said, uh, either on Cigar Club Radio or through Story Geeks, they're gonna they're gonna kick the can down the road, and I don't think it's gonna be as bad as 
I don't think it's it going to be as bad. Look, I think in the end, look, if you want to ask what my prognosis is, I think in the end, what's going to end up happening is we're going to be regulated. We're going to continue to pay escalating um, FDA user fees. We're going to end up with warning labels and there's going to be some sort of regulatory framework, but I think it's going to be navigable, but regretfully it's just going to continue to add additional expenses yep. that sadly we're going to pay that we are ultimately going to make the consumers yep. pay because we don't have a chance. And yep. that's, and that's not good, but I, I think, and this is kind of, and, I, and the reason why I think it's going to go that way is because of uh, the tobacco product directive uh, TPD2, which was what the regulations were passed in the EU approximately seven years earlier than the FDA Act. And eventually it was also the initial drafts of those were also the sky is falling and the world is going to end. And in the end, it didn't. It just became more difficult, more costly to do business. Yep. And yep. I think that's eventually where we're going to march to. I just hope that we don't march to a point that we take what's essentially an affordable luxury and make it the way it's become in Europe. Because look, if you're a, a cigar smoker, you smoke two, three cigars a day and you live in a country like the UK, you're basically talking about a hundred dollars a day. Yep. You live in Australia, a sober Mesa Cervantes Fino, which cost $11 and 25 cents on the shelf in America. 27. That's a $38 cigar yeah. in Australia. Okay. And that makes yeah. it a much, much different game. And I hope that we don't go that way and basically take something out of the experience of the average working person that they can enjoy this and make it something that only the rich and swanky can enjoy. I, I hope we don't go down that road. I don't think it'll be that drastic, but you're, you know, having you on. Here's the thing. You say that. But the Australians didn't think it would go that way. And the Canadians, talk to your friends in Canada. Mm. They didn't oh. think it would go that way either. <laughs> mm. And it's it's a yeah. disaster. Hmm. Hmm. I should reach out because Canada is uh, is top three. We're United States, UK, and Canada in regards to the Story Geeks listenership. Yeah, I mean, I feel, I feel sad for my Canadian brothers. And look, I get asked all the time, why don't you sell cigars into Canada? Because the price has just become stupid. Mm -hmm. I, I would much rather Canadians just do what we did with Cuban cigars for years and buy them and take your chance on whether you get hit with the taxes or not hit with the taxes. Yep. Because yep. The, the Canadian, the way it's structured, the plain packaging, the taxes, the distribution, the VAT. I mean, they take a, they make an $8 cigar into a $22 cigar just instantaneously. Mm. Man. And it's, it's just, it's terrible for them. Sounds like San Francisco. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've done oh, some man. traveling to San Francisco in the cybersecurity field, and I was like, oh, wow, these cigars are way different priced, you know? But, you know, what are you going to do? But your take has been my take. Ultimately, you guys will absorb the fees, do that there, and then pass it on to the consumer because that's what economic progress right. historically in any historical book or whatever has showed. Yep. And I've been that, that's been my stance. And I honestly feel that there'll be a down... Uh, demand will go down slightly and then mm -hmm. it'll leave even out over whatever years, right? Whatever the scale is. And then um, ultimately, if it's ramen noodles or a cigar or a steak in a cigar, no, or just a steak or just a cigar, from the people that I know, it's going to be ramen noodles and a cigar. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> That'd you know? be me too. But that, that's the way it goes. I don't want to give up my steak either, so I'd like to find a I'd like to find a path in between the two. <laughs> that that's the goal, right? Yeah. That that's the ultimate goal with with the FDA. So, Steve, thank you again for your time. I appreciate it. I'll reach out to you. We can go October, November, whenever you want to, uh, schedule wise. I wish you the best of luck with your company. Oh, thank you. Everything goes well. Uh, I follow you on social media. Stoey Geeks, definitely look him up on, on social media. The links to him and his website are there. All you have to do is go to stoeygeeks.com forward slash 331 because this is episode 331 of Stoey oh, yeah. Geeks. I want to remind you that we keep the conversation going all week long. You go to stoeygeeks.com. You can catch us on Facebook. Any complaints for the show, please email to Drew at stogiegeeks.com. Right. <laughs> uh, if you want to give comments, you can email both of us. Uh, I am Joe H at stogiegeeks.com. Remember, 
that behind every cigar there is a story worth knowing. I want to encourage you to shop local and get out there and support your local brick and mortar shop and learn a story or two and tell your friends about Stogie Geeks. Stogie Geeks, thank you very much for watching and listening. We'll see you next time. Peace.